All right, we are recording. All right, thank you. All right, this open meeting of the Triton Regional School Committee is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12, 2020 in the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus. In order to mitigate the transmission of the virus, we have been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings. And as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. I hereby call to order the March 10th, 2021 meeting of the Triton Regional School Committee at 7 p.m. I'm Narissa Wallen, Chair of the Triton Regional School Committee, and I would like to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Erin? I'm here and I can hear you. Thank you. Paul Goldner? I'm here and I can hear you. Thank you. Maureen? I'm here and I can hear you. Thank you. Caitlin? I'm here and I can hear you. Thank you. Paul Lees? I'm here and I can hear you. Thank you. Linda? I'm here and I can hear you. Thank you. Paul Mayat. I'm here and I can hear you. Uh, thank you. And Kaylee? I'm here and I can hear you. Thank you. And I'm giving Tina's apologies. She texted me earlier today that she had, unfortunately, an, another work um, conflict with tonight and could not make tonight's meeting. So um, staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Triton Superintendent Brian Forgett. <laughs> Thank you. Um, School Business Administrator Kyle Warren. I'm here and I can hear you. Thank you. Um, Assistant Superintendent Kim Croto. I'm here and I can hear you. Thank you. And Special Education Director David McGee. I'm here and I can hear you. All right. Thank you. For this meeting, the Triton School Committee is convening remotely via Zoom using the information posted on the district's website identifying how the public may join. If you are personally attending by video conference using your device's camera, please be aware that others may be able to see you. Committee members and administrators, please remember to mute your phone or computer when you are not speaking. All supporting materials that have been provided to members of this body are available on the district's website with the agenda posting unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda. Each vote taken in this meeting will be conducted by a roll call vote. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and that anything you broadcast will be captured by the recording. All right, um, so welcome to the March 10th um, Triton Regional School Committee meeting. Um, I just had a couple of notes before we move into the um, body of the meeting. Um, I wanted to note that um, as of last week's meeting, we talked about adding um, a meeting on March 17th. Um, I have talked to Paul Lees um, from um, Personnel and Negotiation Subcommittee. He's the chair of that subcommittee. Um, and um, the intent is to actually meet at 6.30 that night for an executive session. Um, so I'd ask committee members to hold that time slot and um, let me know if you cannot make that. Um, and then we would have the regular open session at seven o'clock. So on the 17th, that would be a 6.30 executive session and a seven o'clock um, regular session. Um, I also wanted to note real quick, um, the MASC conference, um, which is usually kind of our continuing education, um, that's traditionally held in the fall. That was not held this year. Um, I did receive notification that NSBA, which is our, um, our national organization, um, is holding their virtual conference this year. Um, I think they're calling it the virtual experience. Um, it will be similar, a lot of, lots of focus on policy, the legal side, um, budgeting, relationships, um, superintendents and school committees, um, advocacy, that type of thing. Um, if you are interested in that, let me know. Um, and that is April 8th through the 10th, it looks like. And it is, um, as noted by the name, it's uh, all online. All right. Um, Moving on, we're going to go straight into the, oh, um, real quick before we go into the agenda, um, I would like the committee's um, approval to rearrange the agenda a little bit tonight. Um, Maureen and I were talking about this earlier today, um, and what I'd like to do is do oral communications, consent agenda, student advisory report, and new business, and then go um, and bring, uh, it's item 8A on the agenda, the final budget approval up next. And then uh, 7A, which is the learning model, transition to full in person up after that. And then we'll continue with the agenda in the order that it um, happens. It just, um, I feel like those are, you know, where we're gonna have the majority of um, folks watching from uh, for. So I wanted to move those up in the agenda if the committee's okay with that. 
Are there any objections from committee members on altering the agenda to take those up earlier? Okay, seeing none, thank you. That's what we'll do. All right, um, moving on to oral communications from the public. Let me find my stopwatch and my script here real quick. All right, um, the next item on the agenda is public comment. Members of the public, the meeting host muted you as you entered the meeting. If you would like to address the committee, please indicate now that you would like to do so, either by raising your hand on your video call or using the raise hand option on the participant screen. The meeting host will unmute you so that you can address the committee. Please refer to the public comment policy language on the agenda when making your comments and remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. When you have finished speaking, the meeting host will mute you again and I'll quickly read aloud um, what it says on the agenda. It says members of the public may address the committee for up to three minutes longer with the permission of the chairperson. The committee will not engage Excuse me. The committee will not engage in a discussion on topics raised during public comment, but may choose to add the topic to a future agenda. This agenda segment will be limited to 15 minutes unless extended at the discretion of the chairperson. Um, if there are enough speakers tonight, I will extend that to half an hour, as we have done in um, recent meetings when we've had a discussion about the, um, the remote learning model. Um, again, it's three minutes per person. And um, what we've done in the past is I use a one minute and then when you've got 30 seconds left and at three minutes, you will get cut off if you have not finished your comments at that time. So um, anybody who would like to speak during public comment tonight, again, um, you can use the raise hand option in your participant screen or raise the hand on the video call and I will scroll through screens and uh, see if there is anyone who would like to speak. All right, I see none. I know Brian's usually scrolling with me. Do you have you spotted any, Brian? Sorry, I do not see anyone. Okay, just checking. All right, moving on then. Um, consent agenda. I'll read aloud the donations. Oh, uh, yeah. Here's one, uh, Matt. All right. Yeah, so Matt, I'll make an exception for you tonight, but um, in the future, if you can make sure that you raise your hand actually during that agenda segment, that would be appreciated. I will ask you to unmute. Uh, how you doing? Uh, so as we all know that DESE set the guidelines for returning to elementary on April 5th and the uh, middle school on 428 and the high school to be determined. In yesterday's guidance, they also suggested that you should move to in person as uh, quickly as possible. I have great, great pride in this district. I moved to Newberry so my three boys could have the best educational experience possible. And to wait for Desi's dates is unacceptable. The last year has been very hard on everyone in the district. And I don't think it's real equitable to have different schools going at different times. So I'm asking you today to give Brian the power to return all the schools on April 5th as one community, one Triton, and unite everyone and get this over with. And if you don't, it doesn't really require a vote according to the guidance yesterday. So we can wait and just do the bare minimum. That's fine if that's what you wanna do. And thank you uh, for making that exception, Marissa. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Um, all right, we've got one more, Stacy. Hi there. Um, sorry about that. I joined a little bit late, but um, I just wanted to. My name is Stacy Allen. I have a. I'm an NES parent. Have a sixth grader, fourth grader, and a kindergartner. And um, I just wanted to ask the committee. You know, considering the plans when we do move into full in person. Um, I'm mostly concerned about my kindergartner who is going half days, four days a week, which is great. She's there um, in person four days, but it's four half days. However, she's very behind. Um, and my request would be for the committee to consider for kindergarten, if we are gonna, if everyone's gonna go back full time, I know right now that kindergarten, kindergarten is all half days. If they could potentially go full days, if that was what their intended plan was at the beginning of the year with the option to go half day if that's what other parents would like. Um, I'm just very concerned. My daughter is supposed to be reading at this point and she barely knows um, half of her letters. She can barely sound out half of her letters and the feedback from her teacher, which has been coming on a weekly basis, I've been working closely with her, um, is that she just needs more practice at home. And from what my husband and I, our opinion, just in spending time with her and how she pick, how quickly she picks up at home, that she actually just really needs more time in school. Um, we're a busy family of three kids, two working parents. We're doing the best that we can, but we're not teachers. 
She really needs more time. And I'm just concerned that uh, moving into first grade, that that gap is not gonna be bridged if the kindergartners go back and remain on their half time or sorry, half day schedule. So I just, I don't know if that's something that we're gonna be discussing tonight, but that's just something I would love the, the committee to consider. Um, and that's really all I have, thank you. Thank you. All right, um, Wendy. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm kind of hoping that the, the kids can all get back around the same time as well. And instead of waiting for a date, you know, like a last minute date, um, I, I think if, if Brian can come up with a plan and there is a plan, why, why wait for Dusty to put out a date to get the kids in school by? I think it's so important to get, especially the seniors, get them back, let them have some time sounds like before Dusty puts a date out they're only going to be in school for a couple of weeks it's it's sad but you know, I, ju I just hope we don't have to wait till a date it'd be great to see them all go back at once thank you thank you all right Kathleen should be asking you to unmute so I have a um a fourth grader at NES and um I know that we're the plan is for elementary to go back on April 5th, but I actually think I was going to not say anything tonight because I don't know what the plan is, but I fully trust Brian and his team. And I would like just to see actually go back before April 5th. I know other schools are, there are private schools everywhere that have been back full time all year. So I just would advocate for us to go back as soon as we're ready, as opposed to waiting for a date. Thank you. Anyone else? Last chance. Sorry, scrolling uh, video screens here too to make sure that we're good. All right, seeing none. Oh. <laughs> All right, you guys. <laughs> I really, no more last minute, okay? Once I close the agenda item next time, it's done. Julie Andrews, I will ask you to unmute. <laughs> Sorry, just real quick. I have a fifth grader and a high schooler. And I just don't want the high schoolers to be left out of this when the kids do go back full time. She, my high schooler is really struggling. I know lots of high schoolers are struggling. And as someone else just mentioned, I think that we really need to have these kids all go back at the same time. That's it. Thank you, Narissa. Thank you. Thank you. Last chance, really the last chance this time. All right. I'm seeing nothing it is officially closed um sorry just killing my stop watch here all right um moving on to the consent agenda i'll read aloud the donations there's a new laminating machine given to newbury elementary from the pta at a monetary value of one thousand four hundred and twenty four dollars and ninety nine cents Katie Greer's student and parent presentation was given to salisbury elementary school from the pta at a monetary value of three thousand five hundred dollars Several music sound system items were purchased by Mr. Leonard Nason of Bedford, Mass. for the Salisbury Elementary Music Department in a monetary value of $8,000. New noise canceling headsets were purchased for the students at Salisbury Elementary School from a donation of $952 from the Salisbury PTA. Can I get a motion to approve the consent agenda, please? I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented. Thanks. Second. Oh, second. Whoa, okay, I got a million seconds there. I need one, please. <laughs> I'll second. All right, thanks, Erin. <laughs> Any discussion on that? All right, I need a roll call vote, please, Erin. Yes. Thank you, Paul Goldner. Yes. Thank you, Maureen. Yes. Thank you, Caitlin. Yes. Thank you, Paul Lees. Lawson. All right, Linda. Yes. Uh, Paul Mayan. Yes. All right, thank you. No, Tina and Amias as well. So that passes. And moving on to a student advisory report. And that'll be Kaylee. Um, Kaylee is our student representative. She's um, a full member of the school committee, although she has um, uh, she's a non-voting member. Uh, and Kaylee usually gives us a monthly update on what's been going on and sentiments among the student body. So I will turn it over to Kaylee. And thank you, Kaylee. Thank you. So this 
as time has been unconventional late as of late and things have been changing at a constant, which is pretty much the new normal over at the high school. We started months ago by asking to go to Disney and here we are now finally going back to school. And the thing is that every single person in the school right now is completely split. We're all a unified front going to school every day that we can and going through motions in an average day-to-day -day manner. But it's getting to a point where we are finally feeling as though we have developed the new normal that everyone talked about. Things are starting to become as normal as we can hope for. Activities are happening. People are beginning to talk one in, to one another. We've finally figured out how to make remote school work for the majority of us. And from what everyone's hearing, everyone's been talking about, a lot of us are very excited to go back in. We can't wait to see the people we haven't seen since last March. It's been an entire year now. And it's exciting and people are so happy for it. But at the same time, everyone is so worried. The majority of our teachers have not been vaccinated yet. Yes, we understand that there is the rollout plan happening and that they're finally getting the vaccines but not yet. We are talking about minimizing distancing for the students when the people that we're surrounded by day to day don't have access to the vaccine. And a lot of students are getting incredibly worried about it because they have family members that still have not been vaccinated, but should not be anywhere near exposure to COVID-19. So the way that it's feeling is that we're incredibly split. Everyone is very happy, but we're hesitant. Activities are running and starting to adapt to ways that we have made accessible and able to happen. And the people who participate in them, participate in them because that's what keeps them going through every single day at the high school. And a lot of them are incredibly worried that the minute we step back in person, that's going to go away. Because as the governor had said, the focus is on putting everyone back in school. It's not focusing on activities or any other extracurriculars that normally happen. And with our push that we've had this entire time on mental health, it's just feeling like we're getting lost, just like we did back a year ago now. So I just hope that as we move forward in reopening the high school, we can act in a way that will be the most beneficial for the mental health of the students, as has been our goal for this entire time. And I'm definitely sure that all the elementary schoolers and middle schoolers are just as excited as we are to be looking towards this possibility and this reality that we're going back. Two months, two weeks for that matter, which turned into two months, turned into 12, but we're finally on a path forward that has an end in sight. And we're all definitely looking forward to it, despite all the hesitation that's felt around it. Thank you. Thank you, Kaylee. Any questions for Kaylee? All right, seeing none. Thank you again, Kaylee. Paul, always... You're trying to speak. I think you're muted. Oh, Paulie. Sorry. Uh, Goldner, Paulies. <laughs> One of them. So confusing when you have three Pauls on the committee. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you very much, Kaylee. I don't know if you're hanging around tonight, but you're welcome to. Obviously, a lot of uh, hot button topics on the agenda tonight. So. Um, as always, we welcome any, your input if you want to um, hang out. But I also understand if you have homework to get done, because I know that tends to pile up quickly in high school. <laughs> I should be on for the majority and the remainder of the meeting, but I might have my camera off for a little bit. Understood. All right. Thank, Thank you. you very much. All right. Um, new business. Any members have new business to raise? 
All right. Seeing none, um, that will move us on. We're again going to rearrange the agenda a little bit tonight and take up um, item 8A, which is the fiscal year 22 final budget approval. And I'm turning that over to Kyle, I believe, unless Brian's introducing. Yeah. No, I can take that on. Kyle. Excellent. All right. <laughs> so included in the agenda packet is the full FY22 budget document. Uh, looking at this document compared to the tentative budget that was approved back in February, uh, similar in format, but it has a, a narrative attached to it, as well as some updated figures that we've been discussing all along. Uh, looking at the narrative there, it gives a brief overview of the process that we went through in formulating the budget this year, a little different than in prior years. Uh, it speaks to our approach for uh, coming up with the figures, building the budget itself, uh, where it's largely level services, keeping in, being mindful of the impact of our, our budget on our communities. Uh, and then it goes in, speaks to the uh, new areas of strategic spending after that, both uh, with regard to the general fund, what's, what's paid for out of the general fund, as well as SR2 or uh, federal COVID relief funds. Uh, looking at the new strategic spending, uh, that's detailed in there. Actually, probably worthwhile uh, just jumping right into that uh, page nine, uh, where it details all of the changes from last year's budget, the FY21. Uh, again, we've gone over this in detail uh, over the last few meetings, so I'll, I'll just hit the summary level items. Uh, we have salary changes of 847,000, uh, benefit changes of 221,000, Looking at a comparative with the, the tentative budget, we did update the medical and dental insurance uh, rates based on information we received from our health insurance carriers. Uh, programming changes, special ed out of district tuitions, that was updated since the, the tentative budget uh, based on updated enrollment figures as well as updated assumptions uh, with regard to our, our federal grants. Uh, also special education transportation that was updated uh, for the first year rollout of the new Student Opportunity Act, a component of it, where we'll be receiving a partial reimbursement for special education uh, transportation to the tune of about $100,000. Operations changes, looking at a savings of $85,000 there. And then next it jumps into on page uh, 10, the strategic spending. Uh, we have the first year of full, I'm sorry, the second year of three of full day K, uh, free full day K rollout. Uh, that's $75,000 a year. The current year was the first year. Uh, looking forward to next year, the tuitions will be reduced down to $1,000 uh, for families. The Next item there is the special education specialized programming uh, for $100,000. That's for uh, implementing a new program uh, for right now about three or four students with complex disabilities. And not only is that to, to meet the needs of these students, but also it can be considered a, an investment in the future of cost savings uh, because if any of these students if we weren't able to meet their needs and they had to go out of district, uh, those out of district tuitions would be substantial. Uh, and the third new strategic spending included in the general fund operating budget is the PC network technician for $73,000, that's salary and benefits. Uh, that's given the uh, significant investment in Chromebooks and other technology in our schools. Uh, the, this position would support students and staff uh, in maintaining those. Chromebooks. What's changed since the tentative budget that we've now peeled back from this operating budget is the uh, health and wellness program coordinator. We've shifted that where uh, we've shifted that over to the ESSER two federal grant funds, uh, so that it won't be uh, sub, uh, paid for by the communities. Also, we peeled back the. Technology Integration Specialist, which was $87,000. That's over in the ESSER II funds as well. All of that, all in, we have $248,000 of new strategic spending 
included in the operating budget for a total increase in spending of 1,260,801. Uh, that's a 2.84% increase over last year. Uh, helpful to look at the page 11 sheet there, which details a summary of our, our total operating and total capital expenses. Get total operating expenses at 45.7 million capital expenses of 267,000. Then it walks through the other, the revenue sources uh, that come in. Those have re remained relatively consistent throughout all of our discussions uh, with the exception of state transportation. Uh, our initial ass assumption was that that transportation reimbursement would be about 74% based on information from our, our legislators, as well as information coming down from the state. Uh, we've updated that to a 78% reimbursement assumption, so added revenue that would be coming in. And the net of all of that is supported by our communities. Uh, so looking at the operating assessments for all three towns, uh, given these uh, proposed budget figures, it would yield a for the town of Newberry a $420,855 increase in their operating assessment, 4.2%. Six percent uh, for the town of Rowley, one hundred and twenty-four thousand, one hundred twenty-four thousand five hundred twenty-four, or one point one three percent increase, and then the town of Salisbury, uh, seven hundred eighty-seven thousand eight hundred sixty-three dollar increase, or five point eight one percent. I went through that pretty quickly. Uh, again, just where we've been chatting about it, uh, but certainly any questions from the group. Questions from the committee? All right, I don't see any. Kyle, can you just talk about, um, you had emailed us that there was gonna be some a slight change. Thank you, I appreciate that. Cities, I understand. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> in the world of Excel formulas, uh, okay. we want to avoid pennies. Uh, so the way that the budget gets allocated to the communities is based on student enrollment, based on headcount, student enrollment. Uh, so when we created those percentages, it didn't round the assessments to the nearest dollar. There were pennies hidden in this chart on page 11. Uh, so it was misleading to the tune of a dollar or two in a couple areas. And while that's, I don't want to make a mountain out of a molehill, it was, it caused the balance to not appear balanced. Uh, so the impact of that was the budget, the operating budget was actually reduced by $2. Uh, so $45,732,299. And the town of Salisbury's assessment was reduced by $1. And what I can do is I'll uh, certainly update the document as a whole, and that'll be reflected on the website, should it be approved. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Kyle. Yeah, so um, the long and short of that was that we had the this current document in our agenda packet. Of course, once we're on the, within the two-day posting period for open meeting law, we can't change that. Um, so what we opted to do is make this note tonight. Maureen is going to read the motion. We'll see if there are questions first, but Maureen's going to read the motion with that alteration um, of those couple of dollars. And then um, Kyle will get out an updated version of this document to all of us so that we have a final, um, a final budget book, the actual document itself that reflects the, um, the motion that's being read tonight. Thank so, you. Again, I apologize for that last minute change. I'm glad you caught it, Kyle. <laughs> I would expect you last again. You can't see it in the budget book, right? But um, but it's happening behind the scenes, so, so yeah. Right. And so this is a, a document that's existed for many years. So I apologize, he found the error after me. <laughs> and I'll be the one to call Neil and tell him his assessment went down a dollar for Salisbury. <laughs> We're keeping track of every dollar, so. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So um, before we go on to take a motion, are there any questions on, um, on anything that's in the budget book, budget discussion at all. All right, seeing none, um, Maureen has the official agenda or the official motion. Yep, all right. Um, I move to approve the fiscal year 2022 final budget of 
$45,999,593, including both operating and capital debt costs, with a total operating expenditure of $45,732,299 and capital expenditure of $267,294,000. Resulting in a combined assessments to the town of Newberry of $10,386,957, to the town of Raleigh, $11,220,983, and to the town of Salisbury, $14,455,212, uh, with the remaining balance of Nine million nine hundred and thirty six thousand four hundred and forty one dollars being funded to by other state and local revenues. Thank you, Maureen. Can I get a second on that, please? I'll second the motion. Paul Goldner. All right, thank you. Any further discussion on this? All right, seeing none, I need a roll call vote, please. Aaron. Yes. Paul Goldner. Yes. Maureen. Yes. Caitlin. Yes. Paul Lees. Yes. Linda. Yes. Paul Mayette. Yes. All right. And I'm yes as well. So thank you all. So that passes um, with eight votes. Uh, I know this has been a tremendous and time consuming process, so I would like to um, extend my thanks for the many, many hours that um, that Kyle, especially, I believe I'm understanding he spent a good part of his weekend making sure that this hit the agenda on Monday. Um, so thank you for all the work that you've put in um, to the superintendent to the work for the work that you've put in. And um, I know there are obviously a lot of moving parts in here that have involved principals and facilities manager and I mean everything across the board. So um, thank you to all of those who have, who have done the work that got us through, I don't know, I think it was eight meetings, I tried to count it earlier, um, from basically the middle of January to now countless hours in between. Um, this, agenda, or this budget will now get um, certified to the towns um, and those numbers that um, everyone heard read aloud here will be on the um, town meeting warrants uh, for the town meetings that are coming up in May of this year for approval. Um, it does require approval of two out of the three towns um, in order for our budget to be considered approved. Um, so that's the kind of next step in the process. As much as we'd like to say we're done, it's just our piece that's done and we're passing it on to the towns um, to kind of continue with their budget process. I should say as well, thank you for the town. We've had two, three um, district communications meetings too with, um, with our town officials. Um, so we always appreciate um, their uh, participation in that process as well and the feedback that they provide. All right, um, moving on, the next item on the agenda is learning model transition to full in person. Um, so the first thing we're going to do here is receive updates. So I'm gonna go back to kind of the list that I ended up with at the end of last meeting. And um, we're gonna take a walk through that list and get updates on those. So Brian, can we start with survey? Um. Unless you had an order you wanted to walk through them and I'm just going through the order that they kind of came out of the last meeting. I can I can I use my notes? Absolutely. So <laughs> I don't want to throw you off. <laughs> just just so I make sure I give you all the updates. I think I'll probably hit all the topics. I think the two that were separate were I know you had PA policy as a separate item in negotiations. Yep. So I'll touch on that, but I think those are both certainly kind of separate discussions. Yep. Um, so if you're okay with that, I appreciate that. So um, again, just as a, by way of an update, um, I you know there a lot uh, that we shared last week is consistent this week. Uh, so my goal is to provide you just a quick update on things that have changed. Last Wednesday when we spoke, we were talking about hypothetical guidance. You now have the um, the guidance document, and actually for anyone listening. Uh, both the survey results from the family survey as well as that guidance document are on the Triton Stay Connected page. Um, so if you are um, listening and want to see that, that document, uh, the state guidance and the survey results are posted there. Um, in sum, 
Um, it is almost entirely what uh, we expected it would be. Uh, they, the commissioner, again, uh, received the authority last Friday to determine when remote learning no longer counts uh, for time on learning as required by uh, law and uh, uh, regulation in the state of Massachusetts. So um, as he promised, he said that uh, if the board gave him the authority that Commissioner Riley uh, would make sure that K-5 to elementary is required to return on April 5th, uh, full in person five days a week. Uh, in the guidance that was released yesterday, um, he did go on to clarify that middle school is now required by April 28th. Uh, high school is a date to be determined. And as of today with a, um, a meeting with the commissioner, uh, he said that he would make that determination by early April. Um, it notes uh, in there that they would give us uh, at least two weeks notice. Um, my concern with that is um, given Desi's track record of late, uh, we tend to get information uh, what's beyond the 11th hour, the 11 and a half hour. Um, often on Friday night, buried under the cover of darkness, uh, waiting for this on a Saturday morning. So, um, so the remote academy is allowed, as noted, or as we've discussed all along, he said that would be. Um, it does clarify in the guidance that um, we can allow, we can have that three to six week window uh, if families are making the choice for their student to move in between the remote academy. Uh, and the full in-person learning. So that is uh, continuing. Uh, to note beyond April 5th, um, with a return on April 5th, um, we have, there are 10 weeks left in the school year as of, uh, as it currently stands. Uh, as of right now, we have one more professional development day to schedule. And that puts us currently um, at Friday, the 18th of June as the final day of school. Uh, just a reminder, um, state law means says that anything, any days uh, we miss prior to March 31st have to be made up. Um, so we, we're still waiting for that April 1st date. So any mystery and uh, surprise snowstorm still could adjust that. But as of right now, it's Friday, uh, June 18th. Um, in discussions with um, other superintendents and even with the commissioner today, um, in, in regards to his thinking about the phased approach versus um, an all in at the same time approach. Um, their thinking behind that is that they medically, they believe uh, we are able to open K through 12, pre-K through 12, um, but that logistically uh, there are many high schools where the spacing is an except exceptional challenge. So in speaking with my counterparts in the area, um, I can tell you we're, we're all gonna end up in different timings you know, certainly within um, within you know weeks of one another, but there are logistical challenges that other districts are facing in regards to spacing. Um, for us, we believe we can create or we can surpass all those hurdles um, at the present time. So, um, as as uh, it was noted, the, the guidance does go on to suggest that these dates are absolute drop dead dates, if you will. Um, and if there is an opportunity to bring students in before that, if logistically it can happen, um, then it should happen. So there is a waiver process. Um, it uh, was very interesting. I can tell you in the conference call today with the commissioner and a whole other cadre of other uh, DESE folks, the vast majority of the time was spent on the waiver process. Um, and it is not going to be a typical, you ask uh, the department and they say, sure, uh, there will be a site visit I will go as far as there will be a site visit to take measurements and walk through and make sure that we uh, logistically can't make it happen any sooner. Um, so the, the guidance, as you noted, um, if, or I'm assuming several have seen it, um, notes that there are, uh, there are uh, ramifications. If we don't meet these guidelines, we have to uh, make up any days lost. And it actually goes on to note, we had kind of several people kind of quoting it as a potential, uh, but the, the official guidance did go on to note that um, by statute, uh, the time on learning requirements are tied to chapter 70 funds. So there is a uh, one 180th um, of our chapter 70 um, that could be lost. Again, whether that would ever happen, that's a debate, it's not worth having. Um, um, and then, um, it, it did note that the, there would be no, no waivers given 
um, for anyone that's making things work uh, for distance, trying to make things work for distances greater than three feet. So in essence, we have to shift down to that three, the three to use the three to six foot standard um, in all of our planning. And so failure to uh, be able to make things work at the at the at four feet or five feet that would not allow us to get a waiver. Um, and then it also very explicitly, and he talked at great length about that today, um, that there would be no waivers granted for communities, um, even with really high prevalence um, and um, COVID rates and uh, et cetera across the board by the various metrics. So. Um, I would say as a result of my my meeting with the commissioner today, the, the, the message was you need to get kids back to school and you need to do it as soon as possible. Um, earlier, uh, actually after the meeting and maybe uh, say only a few hours ago, um, the commissioner has been referencing, I know he referenced it at Friday's meeting, um, a study that was done by the Oxford Academic uh, Group um, and that actually was released just a few hours ago. Um, there's, um, it's, we can share that out. Um, it studied, actually, it's not a Massachusetts group, but uh, they studied the uh, impact of three feet versus six foot distancing um, with all mitigation strategies in place. So um, adhering to a minimum of three, six when possible, but masked um, and all the other the standards and restrictions that we put in place. Um, so those, uh, that study was released and, you know, in summary, the quoting from the report that was released today, the basic finding was, and I quote, lower physical distancing policies can be adopted in school settings with masking mandates without negatively impacting student or staff safety. Um, obviously, I know that's um, a debated concept and topic. Um, certainly, that's a uh, challenging pill to swallow. If you are a teacher sitting in a classroom um, with 18, 19, 20 students, um, but that is now, um, I, could, I would say that is absolutely uh, the Department of Ed's mantra, um, and that was celebrated uh, far and wide over the last couple hours. Um, so coming to where we are as of today, um, I shared with you last week um, that, that we, we, can, we can bring all students back. Um, working with the three to six foot distancing, three at a minimum, six wherever possible. Um, I, I can say to you today, and again, I know the hope is to have a discussion and then come back next week uh, to take a formal vote. Um, with the, with, if the logistics are the reason for delaying and not bringing everyone back, um, I don't believe we have that excuse because we have the logistics worked out. There are certainly things, um, and I'll, I'll kind of just give you an update on the, the various things we talked about mentioned last week, um, but across the board, um, met with principals again Monday, and I think I probably sent them. The principals are on if we end up having any discussions for them or questions for them. So I want to thank the principals for being here. Um, but I, I think I probably sent them 18 different emails today saying, are we sure about this? Are you sure about this? Um, and um, we're working through in the plan that will uh, be produced for next week, um, you know, grade level by grade level, department by department, average class uh, distancing. Um, but all the logistics we believe can be worked out pre-K through 12 um, to bring all students back all at once on April 5th. So at this point in time, that is my recommendation that we move towards that as a goal. Um, we, uh, I think it's hard um, and I, I should say, you know, we're, we're meeting with teachers um, and, and negotiations are ongoing. So this is, uh, this is not a ringing endorsement. This is my recommendation working with the leadership team. And so there are certainly um, details that we need to figure out, um, but a, uh, an all at the same time approach, um, I believe is an easier uh, path forward um, when you have um, 425 employees, you know, 300 and some odd uh, classroom and special educators. Um, and when you have some that we're saying you have to be back in the classroom, um, with smaller students or with younger students, I should say, um, and likely less able to distance, um, that to have that uh, be the message and in, in not uh, bring our middle school and high school uh, students back in as well. Um, when we know logistically we can maintain the distances, um, I struggle with that. So our thinking currently is that we bring uh, all students back uh, as of April 5th. Um, I am recommending and we are planning for full day kindergarten um, that would bring all kindergartners into the building five days per week. 
Um, we are proposing that we do not charge for that. Uh, we would basically have two and a half months left of the year and, uh, and all of our financial calculations and all of Kyle's modeling for the year, uh, we assumed that we wouldn't be collecting any tuition. So all of those losses um, have been made up for in other areas where they're savings or um, stimulus funding and what have you. So um, this would be uh, preschool is currently back into the regular schedule that adjusted um, in the last week or two, right, Kim? Um, so pre-K is back to their regular routine schedule. This would return all K through 12 students five days per week um, to uh, full in-person learning. Um, I, I will say as far as the timing, and uh, I wanna have uh, more discussion with teachers, but we were, we were looking, we were talking through uh, the transition, you know, we have to schedule a professional development day. Um, that is part of the agreement that we made that there would be a transition day. Um, that Friday is Good Friday. That's a challenging day to hold a professional development day. Um, we were actually looking as a concept, um, and I would um, want to chat about this tonight, and if it's uh, what we think makes sense, uh, come back to you and, and formally propose to you as part of the plan. But um, that Monday is a half day already. Monday, April 5th is a half day on the calendar. Um, I would propose we make that a full remote half day. So that is the last remote day and it's remote for all students, even high priority students, make our final connections with students, um, have a true half day uh, early you know, release. Tuesday is a professional day and then we transition all students back on Wednesday the 7th. Um, and then we have Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, short week, work through the kinks and then the following week. Um, so that is the, the kind of the latest thinking about um, how we uh, transition back in. I will say um, logistically uh, between now and next week, again, the, the one um, wild card and, you know, in speaking with other area high schools, uh, there are any older high school um, and certainly we've, you know, a lot of the Triton has was renovated 20 years ago, but um, there are certain spaces that tend to be smaller. Um, by and large, we're, we're in pretty good shape. Uh, but there certainly are spaces where um, the smaller settings um, create, uh, we get, gets us much closer uh, to that three foot distancing. So um, I'll speak in a second about the logistics. So certainly the high school creates the, the greatest logistics. Um, for example, if you're driving out of Triton right now, on your right in that parking lot, the student parking lot up against the uh, softball field there, there are six trailers um, full of uh, equipment and, and desks and tables. Um, you know, that's one of the logistics in finding a way to bring that in, not during school time, can't have people walking through the halls and all uh, doing that um, during school when, when students are there. So those logistics, we do, we do have a plan. Um, and so just kind of want to note that that's the one caveat as we've talked about, if, if there's anything, I would be coming back to you and saying um, formally next week, let's keep that same plan um, half day Monday, PD day Tuesday, shift K through um, eight on Wednesday the 7th, Wednesday the 7th, and then the following Monday for the high school. Um, as of this moment in time, we're still confident saying it could be K through 12 on the 7th. Um, again, just to confirm distancing, we can maintain the three to six. Um, many of the classrooms will be four to five. Um, and then there'll be definitely some at three and definitely some closer to six. To confirm, I know there's, there's been a debate about some places measuring center of desk to center of desk uh, being that distancing. Um, I, I think Department of Ed calls it seat edge to seat edge. Um, we're looking as, it, as student to student. So between students, there are a minimum of three feet of distancing. You know, by way of context, that is not far off. Um, from a traditional distancing. Certainly if you're, you go into a second grade classroom and you have a, a table with four students sitting around it, those students sitting shoulder to shoulder um, are likely closer than three feet or are definitely closer than three feet. Uh, but any, any classroom where you have desks kind of side by side in rows, um, three feet is, is not a, a significant distance. So, um, so that, that distancing can be, be maintained across the board. I reported to you last week that the cafeterias at the high school and middle school are still the greatest challenge. Um, as of today, we have 11 tents, I believe, uh, on order. Um, the first batch of them coming to the high school, middle school, and we should have those by late next week. Um, they are not small tents. We're talking 20 by 40 foot tents. Um, 
and they even come blue and white stripe because that's what they had available. Uh, but these will be set up outside, um, working through with the fire chief uh, and locations and um, learn today we actually need to get permits to erect uh, more permanent tents. So working through that process uh, to have tents outside, uh, likely in that back student parking lot that would extend cafeteria space. Um, at the elementaries, um, the, the uh, all but Salisbury Elementary can maintain six feet of distancing and having students sitting uh, facing the same direction. So no students are facing one another. Um, at Salisbury, just it's based on the tables. Um, it's it we don't we can definitely maintain the six feet, uh, but likely there'll be uh, places where students will be facing one another. So so we're um, ordering. Uh, plexiglass dividers for those spaces where a student would be would be six feet but facing one another. Um, certainly elementary students eating lunch there is a strong chance of things um, being projected from their mouth. So uh, in those cases where it's maintaining the six feet but facing one another we will have plexi dividers. Um, there's also a couple places in kind of some specialist classes where um, even even with six feet of distancing, if students are facing one another, um, we'll have those plexi barriers. Um, as far as the vaccine. Um, Brian, can we stop there real quick? Cause I feel like you've given us a lot, like way more than I was expecting. <laughs> um, so can we stop and take questions if there are questions from the committee first? Sure. This is, I was hoping to take all bite-sized pieces and it has not exactly come out that way. <laughs> um, Maureen, go ahead. Brian, I just have a quick question, um, maybe two quick questions. Um, so you talked about, um, you know, the fifth would be full remote half day with PD following for teachers. Tuesday would be off for all students as the teachers use that as their transition day. And then um, all in on Wednesday with the possibility of middle school needing to come on the 8th and then the high schoolers possibly the next Monday. So my question is, what would happen to the high schoolers that week? Like, so I'm assuming they'd be remote Monday like everybody else. If, would they have Tuesday off? Would the high school teachers be using that as a transition day? Yes, yeah, so the only correction, um, middle school would come on the um, 7th as well. We'd be talking oh. just the high school in its entirety. Um, so we hadn't talked specifically, but yes, absolutely. Monday and Tuesday would be the same. That would be the final transition day um, mm -hmm. that we have built into the calendar. Again, that doesn't change the last day of school because that's mm -hmm. that one floating day we haven't scheduled yet. Um, but that would push the middle school, I'm sorry, the high school to the following Monday. Um, and we hadn't talked about whether it would be true cohorts AB um, on the Tuesday, Wednesday, but I mean, at a minimum, yeah, we would, we would keep with the hybrid schedule for the balance of that week. And again, at this point, I don't believe we need to, right? There, I think there are logistics like the tents and we're working with an outside vendor to not only get them in, but also to get them um, installed. So I don't believe we'll need to do that, um, but that would be a fail safe. Yeah. And you mentioned that the um, needing a permit for the tents, I mean, have, do we know from the town of Newberry if, what that process is? Um, we just learned that today. Um, but I can tell you that they've always been incredibly easy to work with, with a building inspector. Um, so I don't anticipate that they would be, um, if, if we were building a building, obviously a much lengthier process, um, but it's not, it's, it seems to be a, a fairly, it always has been a fairly straightforward process, so. Okay, and then last, just quick question. I feel like we talked about maybe needing to order some desks for Pine Grove, I believe. So it, can you just say where that stands? Have we placed an order? I was gonna to get to that later on. Okay, uh, sorry. <laughs> I'm jumping you ahead. Yeah, um, the, um, so we have those are on, on order and we were able to do an expedite option. So I believe, Kyle, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, we expect those within the next two weeks. Is that correct? Uh, correct, yep. So we're expecting the week of the 22nd, 22nd for those to arrive. Okay. Thank you. That's all I had. And just to confirm, so we're using, um, I think that was farther down my notes, but just as far as logistics, um, we have, for example, we have partnered with a local moving company to help make sure that when we're ready and when we, you know, when, when teachers aren't in classrooms and students aren't in classrooms, um, 
that we have the ability to have those extra hands to get all that equipment back into classrooms and desks in the classrooms. Because don't forget, you know, we're still functioning in hybrid, which means all of our regular cleaning and maintenance crews are doing their regular needing to clean the building and disinfect the building every night. So um, working through all those and partnering with outside vendors. I feel like there was another hand. There was, Polly. Um, Polly, are you going to ask the same question I was going to? Thank okay. you. Thank you. Paul Mayotte. Um, I have two questions. I, I just want to make sure I've got this plan right for the fourth, fifth, and sixth. The so it's it's a remote half day on Monday, PD day on Tuesday, and then back in full on the Wednesday, and that includes the elementary schools. Yes. And that would satisfy Desi's requirement as far as being back in full on the fifth. So there's there's a test, right? So the as of the fifth. The time on learning requirements are back in play. So we need, so the expectation is we are full in person learning five days a week as of the 5th of April. So anything that happens as of the 5th that's remote doesn't necessarily count for time on learning. So the high school is closer to their time on learning hours. The high school or the elementaries have far more. So basically that half day, we wouldn't be able to count that half day towards our elementary time on learning, but we're hundred plus hours more than required. So that day will still count. It will count towards one of our 180. And it's the half day that's already on the calendar that we had already accounted for on our time on learning. And same with the Tuesday. The Tuesday is that additional PD day that kicked Again, it doesn't change what's on the calendar, but it moved the, the end day of school, the last day of school. Okay, so it, it, yeah, it, working around the fact that they use time on learning is their way of gaining that. Correct. Mm -hmm. there. And I was just wondering the, the breakdown of where the, the 11 tenths are, do you have that broken, like what, what, how many are going to which school at this point? Or is yeah, that all? Five, five at the middle high school and two at each of the elementaries. That's all I've got. Thanks. All right. Any other questions, Aaron? So do we need to contract somebody to put the tents up? Or is that something that we're well, yeah. yep. we have someone that's coming in to uh, install them? Yep. Okay. And do you also are you planning on putting tables and chairs out in them? Is that another cost for that? Or would what's the plan? So that's seats. So that's at the middle school, high school. That's um, actually desks, um, arm desks. Yeah. So that's the same way the cafeteria is set up now. Um, and we have a lot of them. Um, so those would be outside. That's, you know, that's a risk. Obviously, if we're using outside spaces, then we're not, we can't bring those in every single night. Yeah. Um, so those would be outside. We're looking at ways to secure those. Um, but I, if you've been to other schools that used outside, uh, spaces in the fall that is very traditional that you see them set up and it just looks kind of odd but yeah so those would be at the middle school high school um, those would be existing desks single armchair desks okay what about at the elementary schools that's the in the cafeteria so the tents would be used more for outdoor spaces for snacks um, for spaces if it's the weather isn't good to be outside just to go stand have a mask break um, and be able to have a snack and stand six feet apart um, cafeterias eating, all eating will be seated in the cafeterias that the tents won't be used um, for lunches. Thanks. Any other questions from the committee? All right, I have a couple, Brian. Um, what are, is there weather that the tents can't be used in? Is there weather? Yep. Um, yeah, if we got a hurricane, we'd have to take them down, but. Okay, I wasn't sure like, can you use them in a rainstorm? That's a yes. Thunderstorm. Oh yeah, no. These are these are we're talking five thousand to four thousand dollars a piece. So these are not these are not easy up tents, right? Yeah. These are come in and um, even uh, probably likely several of them will be on um, the the pavement. So these are installed until they're removed. So there, I'm, Kyle's unmuting and probably I'm sure there's weather ratings and all kinds of uh, information yep. on this. Uh, correct, yep. So they're uh, fire retardant rated, but then we also spoke to a school district uh, who had purchased these tents 
last year and they spoke to the the quality and they actually had snow come in on these and they brushed them off and uh, they they said that they were of the, the high quality that they were um, depicted to be. Okay. So our intention is to leave to leave them up uh, for the foreseeable future. Okay, so they'd be like a semi-permanent feature. Mm -hmm. I, we would want to take them down in the winter, uh, but yeah. Okay. We looked at uh, versus buying, and renting wasn't all that much cheaper. Um, and ultimately, if this is not a short amount of money, but ultimately this is this will be eleven tenths that we have in storage. It can be used for events. Again, it's not. I don't, I think we're having them professionally installed the first time. I think we'll probably realize after the fact when we're setting up one for an event or for a season, an athletic season, I don't think we'll need to have them professionally installed. But at this point in time, um, time is of the essence and let's have it done right the first time. But these, these we will have in you know, years and years into the future for many other uses as well. Okay. Um, can you talk about um, full day K and kind of what your plans are for that? Um, as, I mean, it's something we've traditionally had um, a half day K program as well. Is that still going to be optional or are we going to tell everyone that they have to do full day kindergarten? Um, paid, unpaid, like, I, I guess I'm looking for yeah. details around that. Yeah, no, I had said, we're not, we're not going to collect payment. Um, that is certainly like I had mentioned, Kyle, in all of our calculations have modeled out the fact that we would be having the half day K for the year and not collecting. So all of those losses are offset in other areas. Um, and so this would be traditional full day K, which means that um, as we have done in the past, um, if someone needs transportation midday to go home, and then set, um, then that's fine. So there, the, the, I don't know how many years, Kim, two, three, four years. Um, it's been that all of our half day students have stayed for the first half of the day and then left at the midpoint in the day. So we haven't run, actually there's been some occasions, but majority has been full day K and students who want to leave at midday, leave at midday. So it'd be the same setup this year. Okay, all right. I feel like I had one more question, but I have lost it. So yeah, I, I'm, I've lost it. Any other questions before the superintendent goes on? All right, seeing none, can we, I'm not sure where you're headed next, vaccinations? Okay. Yes, and I apologize if I repeat some of those things because I'm gonna, if I, I'm just gonna go through my notes and some of that might be to brief it. I'll try and uh, make sure any of the questions that were raised and we answered, um, I don't repeat. Uh, as far as the vaccine, since last week, I can tell you it's gone steadily downhill in regards to our ability to set up a clinic. Um, I had partnered with a local pharmacy and it's very clear that the state is prioritizing that vaccines are going to state approved sites. Um, so um, there's a, a local, the Lower Merrimack Valley Collaborative is our nine towns, the Pentucket towns, the Triton towns, Amesbury, uh, Newburyport and, and uh, Georgetown. Um, there have been some um, scheduling messages that have gone out to residents um, for a clinic this weekend. And so they are um, made some attempts at trying to get our educators and ultimately they're not eligible yet, so couldn't register. So we're doing everything we can to support. Um, teachers are being incredibly creative nationally uh, through CVS. Um, educators as of last week are eligible uh, for the vaccine. And so um, there's, there's a method to the madness and being on at 545 and refreshing about 117 times. Folks have been having success getting those appointments. Um, I do know the towns in this, the, I'm sorry, the Lower Merrimack Valley Consortium or Collaborative is talking about trying to prioritize educators. Um, that's literally an email about 20 minutes before the meeting. So I don't know what will happen there, um, but we're doing everything we can as of tomorrow within the state, K through 12 employees are eligible. Um, and I, I'm hopeful that we, that all educators will be able to get a first dose certainly before the fifth. Um, but I think the ability for us to run an in-district clinic, um, as I've been working on that for the last month and a half or two months, is just, is just not uh, gonna become a reality, um, simply because of the fact that the state is prioritizing doses um, to their sites. Um, as far as the remote academy. Um, Can we just stop there real quick? And I, before we move, questions from the committee? 
So I guess my question is, A, I find it, you know, I, totally obviously not your fault, but um, I find it tremendously disappointing that we've been indicating all along that we'll be able to offer something for educators or that we were trying to offer something for educators and then, um, and then that's falling through. So I guess my question is, uh, there have been a lot of districts that have looked at other options, um, trying to buddy up teachers who are struggling with getting appointments with someone who can work on a more full-time basis to get um, to get an appointment for them. Uh, I know in some cases they've enlisted um, PTAs to try and help with that. Are, what else can we do to try and help our educators and, and all the staff um, get access to vaccinations? So um, I know that's happening among the staff. I've seen emails actually floating around today with buddying up. So someone who has the ability um, to get the vaccine, um, I'm sorry, someone who's already had the vaccine or is scheduled and has the time at 5.45 a.m. to go and um, register someone else. So I know that's happening organically. That's not something the district is organizing, um, but my efforts are being spent and I'm, I'm hopeful, again, that email that I just saw that the Lower Merrimack Valley uh, Collaborative will uh, be able to find a way to prioritize um, educators in the coming weeks. Um, but Aside from that, and certainly we can reach out to the PTAs and see if there's, um, uh, I guess, more formal buddy program, if you will, like you were explaining. Um, we can reach out to them and see if there's uh, an ability to um, to do that. I mean, you have to be willing to share dates of birth and, and insurance cards, right? And so I know I've heard several people say that, love the idea, but no, I, I don't want to give you my information. So. Um, I don't, I don't have any other solutions at this point in time. Okay, I guess I can just say, I'd, I'd like to see us do whatever we can. Um, if, I mean, I'm happy to personally make appointments for people if they're comfortable with that and spend some of my time doing that. I think we need to do what we can do, right? To try and help educators um, get access to, who want access to, um, to the vaccination, get access to the vaccination. So I'll, I'll just leave it there, I guess. Well, we, we do not disagree with that statement. Go on. All right. Any other questions in the committee before we move on? All right. Seeing none. Sorry. Um, so for the remote academy, um, we mentioned last week that is an option. Um, it has been noted and the commissioner did confirm that as of next year, um, there's been a difference of, of terminology. Uh, we were told we'll not, we will not be allowed. The guidance says that we don't have to. Um, so there's a lot of clarification that needs to happen for next year, uh, but as of right now, uh, the commissioner has made it clear and in the guidance that the remote academy is on the table um, for the balance of this year. So um, as I mentioned last week, we do have capacity K through six, um, so we are able um, to have any students, if there are more students who move into the the remote academy, we can um, fit for them. Um, I will tell you, and I confirmed this um, with the president of the TRTA, just to make sure I wasn't speaking out of turn, um, that we have agreed in principle um, with details to figure out, but to be able to say to you publicly that we have agreed in principle that seven through 12 educators will stream so that students who need to shift to the remote academy, who are not currently in the remote academy, or um, if they are in the remote academy um, and wanna make that shift, um, that they can remain with their current teachers and their current classes and stream into their classes. Um, we would require a commitment just like we would for the remote academy in general. So that's not something where someone can say, hey, I'll be in school tomorrow, then I'm gonna stream tomorrow, next day. And then um, this has to be restrictive because it's only officially their remote academy um, that we can have a different uh, requirement for time on learning. So uh, again, more details to follow. Um, we, I know with the PNN update, we, we have met and we've made some great progress uh, and I'm hopeful we'll have, uh, we have two more meetings even before next Wednesday, so we'll be able to make some progress. But um, I can confirm that we, we do have that agreement in principle uh, that Florida virtual at the high school um, or the remote academy at the middle school um, is not the only option so that um, we will help allow folks to, to continue streaming with their teachers. Should I stop there, Narissa? Yes, if we could, please. Questions to the committee on that? I just want to make sure I've got it right. Um, so at the at at the elementary school, it will be kind of the traditional remote academy as it stands. Anyone that does not want to be full in person 
would have to those students would switch teachers and and classmates classes i guess and move into a remote academy class correct correct yeah seven and eight same thing no streaming streaming okay so they would stay where they are remote academy stays where they are um and essentially teachers don't change correct right so someone could request to shift from the current remote academy back into the regular full in-person remote academy, I guess, and stream from a teacher. I think that'd be pretty hard, quite honestly, right? They've been maintaining, um, but but families do have the ability to request a shift back and forth between the models. Yeah, so seven through 12, streaming with existing teachers for those in hybrid is an option on the table. Again, so for this, this doesn't require any collapsing of classes in hybrid to create more remote classrooms. Um, so by and large, the shifts would be if I'm in hybrid, I'm a third grader, I'm in hybrid and at Pine Grove School, and I want to be in full remote, then I would have to change teachers to become part of the remote academy. Um, so that would be the change, those choosing the remote academy. Um, the other caveat I would put out there is to say it would be limited, but if a remote class um, drops to, to two students, and just based on shifts back, and we have then growing need back in the full in-person classroom, we have to make that change, right? We can't keep a classroom of two students. So we would move those two students to another remote teacher and shift that teacher back to one of the elementaries. Um, we did talk about the logistics of if an entire class um, that is currently remote said, hey, we want to shift to full in-person, we would figure out how to keep that teacher with that class for the balance of this year, right? So even if it was a, a Pine Grove teacher and ended up over at Newbury because of space to finish out the year, we would, um, and that was actually, I think, you know, Kim, correct me if I'm wrong, that was coming from teachers um, saying, could we figure out how to not have this pull apart, you know, here in the 11th hour as it's working. Okay, and to just continue on the line that I was on before, high school, remote academy already doing Florida virtual, they can opt to stay in Florida virtual or move to a streaming model if they want to stay remote. Okay. Students who are currently hybrid could opt to move to a streaming model or go full in person. Correct. So you're saying okay. current hybrid, current and hybrid. Yes. Right. Yes. Yep. Okay. All right, thank you. I just wanna make sure I got that clear because that's a lot of moves, potential moves. All right, any other questions from the committee? All right, seeing none, I don't know what you've got next on your list. Um, so for Mondays, um, and this is, a, I would bring this back to you as a formal, um, a formal proposal with the plan. Um, we're looking at uh, potentially we have a 90 minute early release. It, it turns to asynchronous every Monday. Um, we do have more half days scheduled throughout the year. Um, there's three half days for the high school in June for uh, final exams. Um, I can tell you that as of this afternoon, uh, Patrick and meeting with the program coordinators um, are recommending that we don't have final exams at the high school this year. Uh, and so that would free up those three half days. Those could be full days. And so we're, we're talking about, and again, this isn't fully teased out, but the, the, the idea of keeping the 90 minute as a true early release on the final, it's 10 weeks, it's actually nine Mondays because Memorial Day is in there. Um, but those final nine weeks, those final nine Mondays have those be 90 minute early releases. Um, and then that would be, um, that we would, we would trade off with the half days. So um, not ready to make a formal proposal to you yet, uh, but that is something we're considering that would be, again, a, a, an adjustment, but that would be a, tr a traditional release, which would mean that's not shifting home to asynchronous learning. Um, that's a true early release, and it roughly, you know, if the high school where the, the time on learning is so tight, um, it would be offset by those half days that would become full days. Um, to, to Paul Mayette's point about the time on learning, that's a key piece there in that most high schools are so tight it would be the trade-off with the half days that are able to make that work. Um, so the survey data um, in regards to where people, you know, with all of those logistics in place, 
um, where where are where are uh, parents indicating um, that they would have their students. So we have a total of um, 1,816 responses, um, which is approaching 80% response rate. Um, at this moment in time, uh, or as of this point, uh, informally, again, it was, we did ask for parent names and student names, um, mostly just to double check and make sure um, that we're, you know, are, are able to confirm that we don't have uh, bogus results in here. Uh, but the, uh, at this point, we got fairly even response across the, um, the schools, across the grade levels uh, of the respondents, um, just shy of 72% were currently hybrid in person, 11.2%, uh, 11.3% are in the remote academy, and about 17% are high priority students who are learning four and a half days in person. When asked the question, um, what model will you choose? Again, the, uh, there were only two options. Um, when we move to full in-person, hybrid is no longer an option. Uh, so um, the choice was, uh, in, and again, we weren't at a place where I could say to you that we have a, <laughs> or even in the survey to be able to say, we have a, an agreement in principle with details to figure out about streaming. So we talked about another option, um, but the, the options were basically um, full in-person or remote. So as of this point in time, at the, as the survey closed out, 88.11, uh, or 88% uh, families are, are saying that they will keep their students uh, full in person and 12%, 11.89% uh, say that they will keep their students in the remote academy. Um, that is almost identical uh, to our current enrollments in regards to the remote academy. Um, it's been uh, upper 11s to 12% um, of our total population is in the remote academy. And then if you combine those who would identify themselves as high hybrid two days per week and those who are high priority in four and a half days a week, you combine the two of those and they're all coming full in person. Uh, and that's the same at about 88%. Um, for transportation, uh, it was pretty split um, in regards to what folks are doing now. Um, and then for uh, when we do the full return with the transportation, again, the guidelines uh, all the same, uh, except for the fact that it's two allowed per seat rather than one per seat. Um, so a, a traditionally uh, filled up bus, um, we have uh, only 48% uh, of families saying that they will have their students ride the bus. Um, so uh, as we said, we're, the bus routes are planned. Uh, that allows for us to be able to uh, provide all students at two per seat. Uh, so if that does pan out, we will route all students as we have to, as we're required to by law. Uh, but as a, as a uh, matter of uh, practice in regards to the way that plays out, uh, it will likely be that uh, buses have much more spacing um, than, than they would normally um, and would be likely similar uh, to where they're at now. Um, as far as, I probably stop there in regards to the survey, questions about that data? Um, Caitlin, and can I just note ahead of time too that, because um, this was a conversation that Brian and I had uh, actually, Maureen, I think, was in on that as well, um, that uh, at our last meeting, we had actually talked about um, surveying students and opted not to do that at this point. Um, I don't know. Do you want to address that, Brian, just students and staff? Because that was something yeah. that changed between last meeting and yes, kind I, of when things actually went forward. Yes, absolutely. Um, uh, as far as students, um, this is a choice that parents are making for students, right? This, this is not a how do you feel? What do you, you know, those types of surveys and what can we do differently? That's, those are certainly questions we need to ask and, and uh, as we transition back. Um, but this was the decision and this is a parent's decision. So that's why students um, were not um, surveyed. Um, I did have the opportunity to have some conversation with some students, which was great, um, but the, the students were not surveyed directly. As far as staff, um, I think similarly, um, this is not something where we're going to have an option. And so without the ability to give folks an option, um, I, I think ultimately that leads us down a, a, a path of suggesting that we might be able to do something that we can't necessarily do. Um, so I had a conversation with several folks, several staff members, and, and you know, ultimately the decision was to say, you know, it's it's not, it's not fair to ask a survey because there's, we can't give options if we're returning full in person. Um, and similarly, if we know we're gonna have to bring elementary, um, how do we give middle and high school teachers a, a, a different option? Um, and so ultimately um, it, was, it was agreed that there, there shouldn't be a staff 
um, survey either. Thank you. Um, Caitlin, you were on and then fell off. Did you? I, Brian just, well, you brought up my question and then Brian answered it. I was just wondering if the student survey had shifted or changed. And I was wondering if there was a student survey that we didn't see and that's what got the streaming situation going. So now it's all cleared up and I'm wrong. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Uh, Police. Brian, is it worth mentioning that um, as we shift our, our teaching models uh, to that April 5th date and those other dates, is it worth mentioning that we're likely to restrict transitioning from one model to another? I think that's something we should just get the word out. I'm not necessarily cut in stone, but certainly a concern that we have with the amount of time we have left of the year. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, as I mentioned earlier that the, the, the guidance allows for the four to six weeks. Um, I would suggest we, we maintain that. We currently have uh, in Arbor, uh, reopening plan, our, our guidelines, we have um, a four week expectation. I, I don't know, Kim, answer, 90% of the time, <laughs> we're able to do it much more quickly than that. Um, but certainly that is, especially at this point in the year, um, if, if a family needs to make the choice, and there are a lot of reasons why a family might need to make the choice um, for full remote, um, we want to make sure that they're not switching back and forth because that's not good for kids. So if it's one difficult decision, um, let's do that one time and, and find as much success as we can for that student for the final 10 weeks. Um, as far as staffing, I, I would say, you know, at the high school, that's going to be the most problematic. Um, and I think it's, um, it, it needs to be where a student, a family is making the choice whether they want to be in person or remote. They can't shift back and forth because um, that doesn't work for teaching. Um, that the, the teacher needs to be able to know where the student is um, and set those expectations. So yeah, thank you for bringing that up. And can I just add that we will um, send out some information for any families who are new to the remote option who would like to join. I did receive a few emails. So that information will be forthcoming after next week's um, meeting once everything has been firmed up. Um, and the people who are already in the remote option do not have to reapply. I had a few emails about that too. And just to piggyback on what Brian said, I would say it's very disruptive at the middle school and high school level if, and I know April vacation is coming up and if people are thinking of extending April vacation for you know a week or so and a, a solution in their minds is, well, you can just do the remote option for an extended time. That's really not the purpose of it. And that's what we're trying to avoid because that is really disruptive. And with the last few um, months in the school calendar, we really want to maximize the, the learning for the students at this point. Yeah, I would say the high school specifically, I know that's the, um, the concern about, I'm not gonna get out of bed today, I'm just gonna stream, right? That whole, so it's, uh, yeah, we need to yeah. have consistency, consistent expectation. Correct. All right, thank you. Any other questions from the committee? All right, back to you, Brian. Um, so rounding the term to the finish line, um, so again, just to confirm the logistical challenges. So at this point, um, we have a path. We fully expect that over the next week, I can fully confirm that in writing that we are all set K through 12 um, to return on that week, the 5th, 6th, 7th. Um, the, the logistics of the tents is a big moving piece. We believe we've got it all set up with time to spare, actually. Um, but just to confirm that that's a logistical piece we're watching um, at the elementary, again, the lunches are confirmed, the tents are for, uh, for snack. So we don't need to use outdoor tents for elementary. All the elementary will be able to eat in the cafeterias six feet apart. Right now we're looking at, unless some shifts happen, right? At the, all the grade levels could fit at Newbury, I think there was one grade level at Newbury that was a challenge. Newbury and Pine Grove and Salisbury would have students facing one another um, in some cases um, with those plexi dividers. Um, we are also, as of today, we had we put postings up um, across for all five all five schools um, for we're calling them um, general uh, lunch general monitors. Um, so at the elementary, there's a definitive need for lunch and recess. Um, obviously, the smaller kids need more monitoring. 
Um, and at the high school, middle school, we've talked about the potential need. So we posted for the um, for the need, and then whether that be something that it's it's monitoring hallways or, or what have you, um, working through exactly where those might be needed. Uh, it's a much more identified need at the uh, elementary level. Um, furniture, I spoke about the fact that um, we've got plans in place. The high school, middle school is certainly moving uh, 291,000 square feet of furniture back in is no small task. So we've got um, our own um, workforce, our custodial maintenance crews. It's likely gonna be overtime. That's the, the hope is, you know, we would much rather have our folks in and, and uh, working and, and getting overtime where appropriate. And then we also have outside groups that will be coming in, help moving, helping set up tents. Um, and Someone asked about the desks, so we're good with desks. Someone asked last week, I don't remember, um, are we good with desks at Salisbury? Absolutely. The only place that we have a desk shortage um, is Pine Grove School, and that's because, as we spoke about, the fact that the project actually bought all new tables, um, and so we need enough desks for all students. So that final order is in, as Kyle mentioned, the week of um, March 22nd. Um, and again, that will be outside um, work and outside the regular work day to uh, get all those desks put together because they don't come assembled. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, I think that just the key is, is, you know, this has been all discussion. So hopefully you give me additional guidance, thoughts, agree, disagree, and then we come back next week with a final plan um, for you to approve. All right. So Linda has a question, it looks like. Uh, I'm sorry to go backwards a little bit here, but you said that 48% of people are going to be using the transportation, which means there's going to be a lot of parents dropping their kids off at school now. Is there any contingencies of what's going to happen when you have all these people showing up at the same time? Um, I would say I'm more concerned about pickup than I am drop off. Um, drop off tends to be, um, we, we will certainly um, work if we release de details or what have you. Um, we're not, you know, I've, I actually haven't spoken directly with principals about this, but you know, there's, there's some districts that have talked about the DESI guidance, you know, staggered start and stop times. I, I don't believe we'll need to be at that point. Um, I think parents need to prepare for that. It's, it's gonna be not, it's gonna be more than usual. Um, but by and large, that's fairly typical for us, right? They definitely will, the numbers will be bigger, right? There's definitely more um, parents picking up um, than, or we expect there'll be more parents picking up and dropping off than usual. Um, but we, we don't have, um, uh, on a regular typical day, morning ridership tends to be larger than afternoon ridership. So um, parent pickups in the afternoon is, is pretty standard. And I know um, if you go to any of the schools, um, parents know that if they need to get out of there quickly, they're, they're there half hour, 35 minutes early so that they can get that front spot, get in, grab their child and be off to whatever appointment is that they need to get to quickly. So um, I would say thinking through contingencies, yes, but I don't believe we're at a point where we would need to stagger start and stop times. Okay, thanks. Um, in regards to the April 5th start date, I want to thank your team for coming up with trying to get the kids back as soon as possible. I think that's going to make a lot of these kids happy and a lot of the parents as well. Um, I still have a concern with the teachers not getting vaccinated. Um, has there been any talk about um, possibly of teachers not coming back unless they're vaccinated. Teachers not coming back, meaning we're not requiring them to come back or them using not to come back? Well, feeling uncomfortable about not getting at least one vaccination before they come back. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think that's, um, yes. I mean, educators want, and I want, right? I want everyone fully vaccinated before we come back. Um, if we had more of a choice and it wasn't um, creating such a discrepancy and expectation across, you know, a group of employees and a group of educators and families, um, I would I would feel differently. But I absolutely it concerns me greatly, and I'm hopeful that 
Um, the state, I don't know if that was before we started, the state, you know, designated four educator days. I think there's one at the end of March and three that go into April. Um, and it will only likely uh, vaccinate about a tenth of those that are that are needing it, um, K through 12 employees across the state. So it's certainly um, personal opinion, uh, too little too late. Um, but I, I'm going to keep working. Um, I, I'm can't say as a matter of fact that the, uh, the my partnership with a local private <laughs> pharmacy um, who has shared frustration in the paper <laughs> himself, um, I, I, that's not completely off the table. I think it's highly unlikely at this point based on the way the state's moving. Um, but you know, I think you know, to Marissa's point earlier, if there's any creative ways that we can help teachers, um, I know there are many teachers who have appointments. I've spoken with many individuals who are already, already single dosed, um, not a ton who are uh, double dosed yet, but um, unless they had other contributing factors, but nurses, OTs, PTs, you know, they were all phase one. Um, so it's certainly gotten more aggressive now that once we're in this point in phase two, um, that there's, you know, well over a million people vying for those slots. Um, so, uh, it, but I would say to you, I absolutely share your concern. But I wish, I wish we could get all educators vaccinated um, much sooner rather than later. But I wanna thank all of you again for getting our kids back as soon as possible. I think it's very important for them to be there. And if you're asking for guidance, I think you're doing a great job guiding us. Thank you. Thanks, Linda. Um, I thought I saw Maureen's hand go up. No, yes, no. She keeps going up and coming down. <laughs> no, I'm not sure. Maureen's having an indecisive moment. <laughs> no, I just I, I wanted to sort of piggyback on um, what Linda said and, and just thank Brian and uh, the administrators for all the work that you've been doing because I know this is a huge undertaking to, to get the kids back in. And I also appreciate you trying to do it as quickly as we can. Um, and following, you know, the state's guidelines. Um, and I just wanted to comment that I think the um, the idea of, you know, removing the final exam days for the high school level is just phenomenal because I feel like that is going to take a huge load of stress off of our high school students' shoulders this year. Um, on a normal year, that's a stressful time for a high school student. So. I think it's a great, it's a great idea. It's a great plan and it gives the teachers some time that they will need as well. So I just want to make that statement. So Kaylee pop her camera on. Yeah, <laughs> this was, I was talking to Patrick earlier. I'm like, I don't want to steal your thunder. I mean, this is all, you know, communicate. Literally, this has been ongoing discussion and it was just agreed today. Um, so I think I only wanted to share that because it has to do with the, the half days that could implicate the Mondays, but um, that will be more widely communicated over the course of tomorrow and Friday with uh, teachers and students. Yeah, I think it's fantastic. So thank you for that. Other questions or comments from the committee? Paul Mayotte. Um, I, I definitely agree that we can't sit around and wait for Desi's next midnight drop. Um, I've... Um, <laughs> seen enough of that at my own job and, and how that affects it. And it's hard when, when that's a quick change. I, I am really troubled with the thought of bringing anybody back unvaccinated without having to. Um, it's, it's, it's been killing me knowing that the, the timeline for the elementary people are so tight. Um, you know, it'd be anybody who got the, the fir a first shot of the two shot dose would have, wouldn't achieve efficacy before 414. Um, we don't have a choice there. Um, we do have a choice with, with the others. And I, I, I don't know. I personally, I would rather see us buy people as much time as possible to get the vaccine. Two weeks buys us three. Um, 
I don't think I'm anywhere near in the majority here, but I, I couldn't not say that. I'm, I'm, I do struggle with that. You say we said two weeks buys us three? Oh, two weeks through April break, get you three, gotcha, okay. Right, right. that's just, I don't know. That, that's just my thinking. Thanks, Paul. So I was gonna, um, if I just would say, I 100% agree with that. I struggle with um, saying for elementary, right? As a leader, it's hard to, to, to always blame and say, well, they, they made me bring you back, but to give to high school teachers, how do I look if I'm sitting there with a middle school teacher, a high school teacher, an elementary teacher? Uh, as a leader, that's really hard to have that conversation and, and um, set different expectations out of fairness um, just because we can. Um, so I, I fully understand that concern, Paul. I, I, fully, I fully get and respect that. Um, yeah, and I, I mean, this all comes down to the just, it, it does go back to, to blaming the state. Um, you know, I, I think Charlie Baker's made it clear that he has no interest in this. Um, as you pointed out, those, those four educator days are a sham. Um, you said 10%, but I scratched out six. Um, yeah, probably is left, yeah. Um, I don't know, you're the numbers person. Um, anymore, it's but, good. Uh, you, you know, it, 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 yeah, it's, I don't know why that wasn't made a priority um, when, we, when bringing people back was a priority. Okay. And I, I feel uncomfortable enough to say, like pointing out, this isn't a personal thing. I've got an appointment. Um, this is just me looking at other people and, and wanting to see everybody get that. Thanks, Paul. Um, Paul Goldner. Yeah, I mean, in, in principle, I, there I agree with Paul Maya, but I also think Brian's right, and it sounded like the Teachers Association was on board with everybody coming back at the same time. And I'll just say, man, the hostility that I've seen created by different levels doing different things uh, between the, the teachers and the community, I, I think having everyone come back at the same time is going to avoid a bunch, a bunch of troubles that don't need to be created and that might not necessarily percolate to our level but that are still there and creating problems down the lines. I don't know. I, and I'd much rather be waiting those couple of weeks also so that everybody can get a vaccine because I think that's important. It creates that mental security as well. That's gonna make the education better um, also. But um, if, if we're all coming back that week of April 5th, then I think that's better than staggering things out, at least in terms of managing the personnel. So I just clarify one thing. So just to say formally that still having that discussion with the teachers association. So I don't want to speak on their behalf yet, right? There's certainly, I know there's, I would absolutely assume there's mixed beliefs across the board. Um, so I just want to make sure that we, we note that. Yeah. Thanks, Brian. Um, Maureen. Well, I, I was just going to sort of say to Paul Mayad that, you know, we, we do just to sort of, mention again for the public too that we do have PNN does have two meetings um, coming up with the teachers association um, you know and those concerns are definitely talked about so you know my hope as a PNN members you know our executive session that we'll have we'll be able to kind of talk through so um, I understand the concerns I just want you, they are you know we PNN is aware of them too so Thank you, Maureen. Um, any other questions or comments? All right, so I guess it's back to me. Um, Brian, can you talk about, um, and maybe you don't have this piece yet, but communications, because I, I, I know when we kind of had this transition before, and I, I can say I've gotten a lot of questions personally, um, everything from stuff that was covered in the email to 
things that, you know, what, what is guidance and all that stuff? How, what's your communication plan? What do you have one yet as far as how you intend to get this information out and get questions answered about um, kind of what things will look like, or are you not there yet? So, I mean, so up until this point, um, you know, ultimately it's a committee decision. So the, the hope was to, what you had said last week was you wanted to have the initial discussion last week. And so that was, that was your first discussion. Um, and then tonight updates and then a written plan for the 17th. Um, I don't, I did not communicate details out to families because this is, this is thinking at this point. And I certainly, you know, it sounds, it sounds like there's, you know, some consensus around this, this moving forward. So if this were the plan, um, my, my thought would be that to have this in full writing to post with an agenda for next Thursday, uh, I'm sorry, next Wednesday um, by Monday. Um, so no later than whenever that meeting's gonna start, um, 24 hours ahead so that that can be published with the agenda. Um, it's not gonna be a 40 page plan, but a supplement if you will, to kind of basically um, detail everything we've said, um, you know, and we've talked about over the last two weeks. Um, have families have that fully in writing saying this is the proposal, um, have the meeting next Wednesday, and then from there create videos, create, you know, have drop-in sessions like we talked about last week uh, to make sure that uh, everyone's clear on the choices, um, offer some opportunities to get some Q&A, uh, and then ask families to commit uh, by that following week more formally um, so that, that we can uh, move forward by the week of the, the following week, the week prior, um, to know exactly what's going to happen. So it'd be decision, not a whole lot of communication until we can say, you know, a follow-up tonight is there'll be a written plan next Wednesday night. Um, um, I guess I, I, without a vote, I'm hesitant to put anything out there. And I wasn't necessarily talking about next week, but there's a very short time frame if we're talking about the 17th and potentially bringing everybody back the fifth like that's really short yep. so i guess i wanted to know what's happening in those call it three weeks um right to to make sure that kind of we address all that because that's it's really less time i think than we had even even back in any of the you know going back to school remote or um prior to hybrid so yeah, so as I was saying, so it would be the meeting on the 17th, mm -hmm. uh, be ready to schedule. Uh, we talked about forums or drop-ins or whatever, question and answers, have people submit questions, and then um, maybe have that kind of town hall style where it's prepared questions and I can you know, uh, answer questions, um, create some videos so that people um, can, can receive those and watch those on their own time, um, and then be ready uh, by the following week. So the week of this, that's Wednesday the 17th and the week complete that the week of the 22nd and ask families to complete the survey by that Friday, which would be the uh, 1926th. Um, and then have the following week to, to plan it all out. Cause again, we're, we're planning for the logistics ongoing. Um, you know, it's gonna be, I think the vast majority uh, are all pretty clear on what they're choosing. So we know there'll be some swing either way that we have to provision for, uh, but by and large, our, our work continues, whether it's the 5th, the 12th, or, or what have you. Okay. Um, looks like Paul has a question, then I'll come back into my list. I don't know if that's... Yeah, not, not so much a question, um, Marissa, but just a comment to follow up on what Maureen said. I mean, you know, the, the governor came out with his news on, on March 5th. Uh, we met with the teachers on that Monday. Thankfully, they were good enough to scramble their schedules and get in there. It was really the first opportunity to speak with them. Um, I, I'm confident that we can move forward with our plans, but we have to get the teachers on board, okay, with all the particulars, with all the vaccinations. I think discussion about communication to the public is premature. You know, we've got a number of people in this meeting here, um, and I, I don't think it's fair to Brian to try to pin him down to a communication schedule until we get through these other two PNN meetings with. Uh, the teachers you need to get a better sense of, of where we're going to land yes and i'm just looking for a i, I want to know that there's a plan i didn't necessarily want to know what the plan was right i just want to know that we're we're going to be providing that information um to to families um 
Brian, uh, this is a question that I got that I haven't seen addressed anywhere. Um, with obviously with um, with current close contact definitions, it's within six feet for 15 minutes. Um, potentially, we'll have classrooms that are at the three foot mark. Is there? Have you heard of anything about adapting that close contact? No. no. Okay. Right. You know, the only thing I've heard, right, obviously, the CDC has talked about um, um, the life of a vaccinated individual, right? So they've talked about, and, and it's Massachusetts hasn't adopted it, but what would be required for quarantining for someone who is vaccinated? Uh, but no, I haven't heard anything changing, which would mean for a positive case, we're going to inherently have more close contacts. Yeah. Okay. That I think that was the question. Was you know typically it's been kind of that the the circle around um, the positive case, and now it's probably going to be the kind of two circles around the positive case. Is that Not quite right? Because it's the distance okay. individuals too. But yes, it definitely increases the number for sure. Okay. All right. Um, one of the things that came up last week that I had had on my list that um, just you just didn't address tonight, and I just wanted to come back to it because I don't think we had a solid answer was um, grab and go meals. There was a question about mm -hmm. what what would potentially happen with grab and go meals for um, either you know zero to five who aren't actually in our schools, um, or for students who are remote or whatever. Yes, so grab and go meals can continue. And actually, we just learned today, right? It was just continued through the summer. So it actually is now confirmed through September. Um, so, uh, as you know, right, Lucinda is leaving us um, to go basically run things for the state. Uh, so we are in the process of finding her replacement. But absolutely. So, meals will continue. The piece that will uh, be removed is our ability to deliver by buses. So obviously when we're delivering students to and from school, um, two tiers, middle school, high school, and then elementary runs, uh, all 24 buses are tied up um, in the mornings when we would normally be doing bus routes. So Lucinda's working, um, was that just today? She's, she's got all the details thought out so that once we have the remote academy, certainly making sure that we directly communicate with anyone who currently is or moves into the remote academy, to make sure that everyone knows that there's there's they can do the curbside pickup those would stay um, as well as Lucinda has contacts through our neighbors table or boys and girls club um, for volunteers to do deliveries of the meals and those of you who know this these are not this is not a small little bag of meals it's it's a substantial bag of food uh, every Monday um, so yes meal a uh, curbside pickup um, Limited delivery, you know, um, is is workable, um, but and that continue. We'll we'll try and figure out how to get that uh, working right through the summer as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, looks like we have a couple other questions that popped up. Linda, um, I I guess I'm a little confused. Um, Brian, you've made a recommendation that you bring all the students back the 5th, the 7th, the 9th, that yeah. vicinity. Why aren't we voting that tonight so that you have a better guidance so that you can move ahead with your plan? A, we, I don't think we have to vote. It's a discussion, right? The, the plan will be the policy. Um, and I think we're getting there. Oh, okay. I thought you were saying that next week we vote. I mean, so I think that's what I was confused at. Yeah, so I, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, Brian, but but here's my understanding, right? Um, is that the, the plan is what becomes the policy. K through five, technically we don't need to vote because in that it's on the fifth, um, right. that is, it's essentially superseded us. So, I mean, I guess this is, this is my understanding is that um, that even though it's typically not it, under their kind of traditional purview, the state of emergency allows the Board of Education to take this type of, or they're interpreting it, to that it allows them to take this type of kind of unilateral action. Um, so in that case, their authority at the state level would supersede our authority at the local level. Um, the only thing in here that, that we're kind of hitting their timeline on is K through five. So the piece that we would need to 
to approve would be um, middle school or high school coming back before their dates. And then the actual plan itself becomes policy. So that falls under kind of a policy approval for us is my understanding. Let me know if I'm, I'm wrong, Brian, but that's kind of what I've gathered through the school committee channels. Yeah, and even for the waiver, it's not required to have a committee vote, but it's recommended. So my comment about the vote next week was my understanding of what was requested of me. So there's, I guess my answer would be, there, uh, there's no reason why you couldn't vote subject to seeing the full written plan that the plan was to get everyone back K through 12. But I, my understanding is everyone wanted to see the full plan before you took a vote on that. And I think there are other pieces too, which mm -hmm. I, there's not much we can talk about about PNN tonight, but I mean, they have two more meetings um, before then. And as I mentioned during, during um, chairman's comments, we'll have executive session. Um, the intent is to have it at 6.30 prior to the meeting on the 17th that starts at seven. Um, and then obviously policy met earlier tonight. So that was one of the things I was gonna come to next was just for an update from, from you, Linda, on where policy is at. Cause that was kind of one of my, that was on my list as one of the other kind of outstanding items. Okay. Does that make That's sense though? Yeah, yes I, it I does. I think this is confusing cause it's uncharted waters, right? And I would, I mean, I've heard from people that, you know, I, I guess there are all sorts of feelings on this about, you know, legalities and 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 whatnot um so I, i've kind of gathered the best i can to make our plan moving forward and that's where we're at and that's my understanding right now that again may also change over the coming week as far as what needs to get voted but this has been an extraordinary year that is coming to the kids coming back to school it's everybody's doing the best they can um and I applaud Brian and his team. So I just wanted to make sure that there's, for parents out there, that they're not thinking that next week when you talk about a vote that anything could change. Like meaning the timeline that you have of bringing everybody back. I mean, I think I, there are still pieces up in the air, right? Well, yes. I understand that. So, I mean, I guess the way I've seen other districts do it when they're talking about communication is they either do it one of two ways, right? They do it kind of where we're at um, previously this past week where they say kind of, you know, here's the latest sort of, of where we're at, or they do a, you know, kind of here, these are the specific dates we're aiming for or date that we're aiming for, but know that it's subject to change because all these other pieces are still moving. Okay. Um, and I don't- fair. I don't know what, what approach you take, but I don't think until you're at that point, right, where, where you're, you're solid on everything, that you can specifically say, this is the plan, right? It's always going to be the, this is the plan subject to these moving pieces coming into to place. I mean, I, I just read right before I um, logged mm -hmm. on to this meeting, Pentucket's latest update. And that, that's basically what it says, is kind of, here's the date we're looking at, or actually dates in their case, if I remember correctly. And, um, but, but know that, you know, negotiations are still going on and that we're working on policy and logistics and all these things are still sort of in process. Okay, thank you. Yeah, sorry, I, I wish I had more solid answers, but I think, again, this is, it's unusual times, we're all finding our way through it. And um, I'm trying to, Cull breast practices and um, the best information I can from MASC and from other school committees, but it, it's this is we've never been here before. Right. No, I understand. I think a lot of people think these decisions are simple and the process is simplistic, and you're just pointing out how not simplistic these maneuvers are. So it's great to hear that for parents out there to understand that it's just not let's vote and do it. Mm -hmm. Everything has to be lined up in order to do it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Um, I feel like I saw another hand after you. Okay, oh, Kaylee, it was Kaylee. I don't know, maybe she had her question answered. It was just about the meals program. Have we thought about using the school like vans for distribution or would that not work? 
um, it's, we've talked about that. Um, okay. There's, um, I don't know kind of if you can speak to that. There's, there's logistics about um, the use of those as a leased vehicle um, because we lease that directly versus the bus company that's doing student transportation. So um, it's the individuals to drive those, but yes, we're, we've looked at that as well and that hasn't worked out in the past. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then for the summer, I should say too, those disappear. Those are 10 month leases. So those disappear for the summer and then return for September, August. <laughs> Our magical disappearing bands. All right, um, other questions? All right, um, Linda, I was gonna ask you for a quick update on policy. Uh, yes, uh, we met today, tonight, and um, when COVID started, we had a policy that was put out and it gave a brief, um, brief numbers of what Brian was gonna be able to do in case of certain situations. And what we've done was we've taken the DESE timeline of April 5th and we've added that into that policy. Um, we will have it on March 17th for the committee to take a vote. And we've also made some changes to the face mask policy just shoring up that, Brian, maybe you can say the wording of the Multi face mask. Yeah, I think our the policy currently talks about a snug fitting um, mask, but it doesn't say multi-layered. And so certainly I think we talked about the fact that it's either a, tra a traditional like surgical mask or a multi-layered mask um, and not, you know, the bandana over the nose. Yeah. So those are the only two policies that we made changes to. Um, the COVID one, of course, we have to keep a lot of it in line. We're just adding a timeline of what the DESC said about April 5th. So I think that's pretty much it. Yeah, so that's two changes. First reading will come next week and then we can figure out a second reading down the road if need be is my understanding. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, and those, we should, I'm going to look at Brian and say this, we should have no problem getting those um, revised policies into the agenda packet so that there's time to review them in advance. Is that? For next year? Absolutely. Yep. Relatively quick changes. Okay. Um, Paulie's uh, negotiations, I know you can't say much, but, um, and a lot of it's already been said, but we're looking at two more PNN meetings. Yeah, we had one Monday, it went very well. Um, and then we have one on Thursday, uh, tomorrow, and one the following Monday as well. Okay. And we'll have that executive session for the committee um, prior to the Wednesday meeting on yes. that. Okay, perfect. And I think that was the last thing that I had on my list as far as questions and open action items. Um, I just wanted to note, you know, I, I guess I'll, I'll go back to what Kaylee said, um, that I, I have definitely heard from parents who are kind of an all in um, as quickly as possible. I have also heard from parents um, up through this morning within about also starting within about probably three minutes after the survey went out last week, um, who just said, look, I'm choosing full in person, but I'm not in a rush to get back. I feel pressured. I have concerns about health versus having to choose between, you know, the potential risk to my family's health and, um, and my, uh, my student keeping their teacher. Um, and that bond that they've had um, and built with their teachers and their classmates. I, obviously the fifth is a non-negotiable date, but I feel like I need to give a nod to those parents to say, yes, we heard you. Our t hands are tied as far as that's concerned because the fifth is the fifth and we just don't have a lot of choice on that one. Um, I also wanted to register my concern along with Paul Mayette. I, I understand that it's, you know, Kind of been nodded to that it's going on as part of the negotiations discussion but i have concerns about um about the effect that vaccination could have on our staffing um and uh that's that's one too where i've said to myself you know not, not k through 12 i i you know i i think that's 
a, there's solid reasoning for that. I also have concerns, you know, obviously I think we have a, 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 a date of the fifth for elementary school. Um, the other grades are not being pushed in um, on the fifth. And I, I have concerns about, about the staffing difficulties that, um, that could come up uh, rising from potentially not having vaccinations um, significantly underway at that point. And I just want to say too, I, I, the more I read about the state and the vaccination efforts, I mean, it was under duress that they added teachers at all, it felt like. Um, if you watch the press conferences, it was, um, we're doing this basically essentially because the Biden administration said that we had to. Um, and then when I read today, they actually started the commentary um, when I was reading through the, the transcript from today's press conference saying that there were going to be, you know, that there were 400,000 um, staff members that would need to be vaccination, vaccinated statewide and that they were putting those uh, four days in place in that uh, and then farther in the comments um, after saying all that, that um, and kind of touting that, that, that it was only going to vaccinate 20 to 25,000 of those individuals. Um, I feel like this is Baker's nod um, to a, a large issue. And I feel compelled to say in public that I, it's, it's a shortfall. Um, the state can be doing far better than what they're doing. And if they really wanna set dates, they should be doing far better than what they're doing in this situation. Um, and I just find that as, as a huge shortcoming on their part, um, not making this work much better than than, the, than what they're doing right now. Uh, Paulise. I know it's a very short window in that we have a meeting tomorrow and a meeting Monday with uh, the teachers union, but a lot of what we're doing in these meetings is trying to get feedback about vaccinations, about how their staff feels, all the different schools so that we can try to incorporate if there's any, any alternatives that we can utilize to make it better for them. But it's the passage of time and the communication between the TRTA leadership and their members that I think is trying to, we're trying to get that information so that we can do the right thing and try to avoid the suggestion or the situation that Paul Goldner suggested where you're bringing in people back in different phases. And if we do that, I just think that the, the dissension among the teachers, rightfully, wrongfully, whatever, um, it, it's, it's not gonna be a good situation. I, I really don't believe that. So. As I said last week, I believe the vaccinations are the key point front and center in, in the staff's response to it all. Yeah, and I, I can very much understand that. Thank you, Paul. Um, so I guess any other, any further direction for the superintendent and administrative team as they start working toward, or I'm assuming it's probably already in process, but um, they develop that document. And I, I will say too, that when Brian and I had the conversation, um, I said to him, please plagiarize from the playbook in the fall because we've already written a lot of this, right? This was done for the three models um, that were um, that we worked on over the summer and into the early fall months. So we don't need to start from scratch, right? We've already gotten a lot of this written. So I, I fully expect that, um, that while there is still a lot of work to be done because it's this moment in time, right? That a transition is happening, um, that uh, I'm not expecting him to write this from scratch and end up with a you know, document that brings, it, you know, puts it all together that, that um, he can use you know, materials that we've, we already essentially have done. So, so any, sorry, go ahead, Brian. That in my, my, um, my, planning the way I've been uh, you know putting it together is it's a, an addendum to the original document I was not reproducing I don't know how many 45 pages with now the full in-person plan more teased out um, it would reference everything that stays the same and kind of you know bullet everything these are things are staying the same and this is and then I think this is more of a, um, a far more logistically detailed plan um, in regards to the remote academy the options in person, lunches, tents, outdoor, all those logistical details. So. All right. Like we're on the same page. <laughs> Excellent. Any further um, feedback for the superintendent? All right, seeing none, so, we can move. Oh. Can I ask, so as far as that document, 
I assume you would rather have the agenda and it's, as I mentioned earlier, totally um, uh, the, the full agenda with that plan in writing with the agenda. And if that's the case, then it's, uh, I'm gonna need the weekend. So <laughs> if we could do Monday <laughs> and post that on Monday, um, again, I don't think there, there will not be anything new that hasn't already been said. Um, but that would give everyone a couple of days to still read through it ahead of the meeting. Is that is that okay rather than having it out Friday? That is absolutely fine with me. Is there any um, anyone on the committee that has an objection to that? All right, I am not seeing any. I'm seeing a lot of, lots of head shaking. So I would say absolutely. Thank you. Um, and as always, we will try to be respectful of your time and say, you know, again, <laughs> like, if it, if it need if you need to take extra time, you know, and use those weekends, do do what you need to do. Uh, Kaylee. Send a publicity stunt out on that Saturday for the 13th, so it can be exactly a year for when you <laughs> shut down. Oh, Kaylee. <laughs> there are things that we may want to remember and things that we may not want to remember. <laughs> but I like your style. <laughs> Can I ask a, no, one more question? Mm -hmm. So as far as communication between now and next week, right? There's enough people here, over hundred people, that there is information getting out. So I feel like there needs to be some communication. Um, is it, I wanna be as succinct as possible and certainly happy to draft with you, Narissa or Maureen. Um, is it a fair statement to say we currently have tentatively set a K-12 return for the week of April 5th, contingent on further details that will be confirmed and presented next, wet Thursday, next Wednesday evening. Uh, uh, personally, I'm okay with that, knowing that, yes, we, like giant asterisk, right? Um, people need to understand that there are still moving pieces here that need to be resolved. Mm -hmm. I don't know how the rest of the committee feels. Committee. Um, I'm, I'll jump in. I'm fine with that, Brian. I think, you know, as long as it's made clear that there are definitely moving parts and, and you know, you talked about the possibility of some tweaks in the dates, but I'm fine with that. I mean, it, you have to move forward with the plan. So, yeah. Brian, I do have to ask, I, I know Desi has an April 5th date, but in my mind, this is an April 7th return. Um, do we run the risk of having DESE issues if we're calling it an April 7th return? No, as you know, what Paul Mayette, what Paul Mayette, I can't talk anymore. What Paul, oh my, what Paul Mayette asked originally, um, as of the 5th, the time on learning restrictions or the guidance changes. So we already had a half day on the calendar. So that's mm -hmm. still the same. It doesn't count for elementary, but it does for high school because that hasn't that requirement hasn't changed. Tuesday isn't a day anyway because that's part of a that's a non-school day. So um, so there is not right. It's a, a return to full five day in person learning in regards to the the time on learning requirements, which is what we we will as of that Monday that calculation kicks back in and we're fine. Okay. So I would say it today, you know, if I'm writing a, a message to send out to families tomorrow, it's um, it's the week of the week of April 5th with exact dates to be specified and confirmed in writing. And it can be mentioned, you know, it'll be posted with the committee agenda by Monday and discussed and voted on Wednesday. Okay. And are you going to bring a calendar for us next week to vote? For this, this week year. or this year? Uh, I can. Yep. yep. Okay. Cause it'll, right. It'll update if I'm thinking of this correctly, right? It'll need to update that, but then it'll also need to update, oh no, it won't need to update last day of school because we list that as a 180 to 185, right? On the calendar. Yes. I I would suggest we don't bring another color calendar document. <laughs> All everyone cares about, right? Everyone knows Memorial Day and it's the last day of school and that doesn't change. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would say for next week, let's not introduce another calendar. Um, yeah. But just because the 16th and you know, the 18th are they're still on the calendar as real days. Okay. All right. Um, more questions coming up, it looks like. Erin. 
No, I'm going to go against what Maureen and Narissa said, um, but I want to be very careful about putting dates out there that may potentially change based on negotiations or whatever else is going to come up in the next week worth of time that you should only give out the information that we know is for sure that the elementary group has the set date and that we have a target date for the rest of for the middle school and the high school and just to caution that we're putting a message out there that might have to be retracted. I think that's, I mean, okay, I'm, I'm gonna, I see lots of other people raising hands, so I, I'll save my feedback on that one. Police? <laughs> I'm with Aaron. I don't wanna be the guy that goes into a meeting tomorrow and is told, oh, so you've already made your decision. What are we here for? I don't think it's respectful. That is fair, and yeah. Um, Kaylee? Wouldn't we have to address and bring forth a new calendar regardless if we have cut finals for the high school eventually but i'm assuming that principal kelly will have to formally make that recommendation that's what happened in the okay. um in january is he actually wrote um, a letter to the school committee formally proposing those changes okay. and then at that point we have kind of a reactionary calendar vote to that um yeah right i'm i'm yeah, and if we adjust it at, in April, I'm bringing you a 2021-22 calendar in April. Um, and if we brought back that calendar for a formal vote at the April meeting, it doesn't change anything. But um, that can also allow us to confirm the last day of school as well, because mm -hmm. as, once we're past April 1st, we don't have to make yep. up if it's snowing in May. Let's hope not. <laughs> um, police. Oh, I don't think I put his hand down. Oh, you didn't put his hand down. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Um, I mean, I guess, again, there are those two approaches. I, I don't have a, a strong feeling. I think, you know, obviously, if we don't provide information, bad information is going to make it out there. We've already seen that, right? I cannot tell you the number of rumors that I squash on a daily basis where people come back to me and say, like, I heard this was said. And I'm like, it. it that a we have video right you can go watch it but that was not what was said um so you know we could end up in a situation where there's too little information we could end up in a situation where there's too much information um paul is the head of personnel and negotiations i am definitely very respectful of his, his opinion on this one um that could definitely push me to the side to say you know maybe too little information and having to you know, quell some rumors is the direction to go in rather than putting out um, information that may need to change. I, I'm going to say that the way Paul phrased that of sitting with the teachers and that being a sign of disrespect, that certainly would never be the intention. But I, I agree. I think we need to pull back and at this point, keep the messaging very benign and be able to confirm that on Monday, when the agenda is posted, a full written proposed plan um, will be included and then that will be voted next Wednesday. Okay. So, I mean, that doesn't change a whole lot, but any objections or any further comments on this? Seeing none, is there anything else you need from us, Brian? No. Other than to leave you alone so you can not <laughs> <It's> so <bad. laughs> No? Okay. <laughs> hear you say that um okay so i'm gonna call that a moving on then um the next item on the agenda is building community district-wide event and i'm gonna bump that one. well actually i'll introduce this one first so um so over you know obviously uh we don't meet as a committee uh privately but uh i on a daily basis because we have chairs of subcommittees and people that are, are doing different things and have questions. So they're bringing them to me, they're bringing them to Brian, I'm bringing them to Brian um, and getting answers um, for all our constituents out there. Um, we have these conversations and I, I heard from um, a number of members just in kind of these casual conversations like, I just feel like I, you know, I wish I could do something positive. I wish we had, you know, a direction to go in that um, that was kind of more uplifting. That we feel like we're, you know, very much stuck in these same um, 
conversations, I guess, throughout the year, because we've reacted to the virus and then we've reacted to guidance. And then, you know, we're, we're back in uh, kind of these, the conversations over and over again. So I kept hearing that. And then Caitlin said to me one day, like, hey, <laughs> wouldn't it be great if we could do like a big event? Um, and I said, fine, take it and run with it. <laughs> So we've we've come to the point where um, I think I, Caitlin has talked to Maureen, and there's some um, conversations that that's gone on there. Um, if it stays a small group and and you have a plan that you're working to, toward for fruition, um, you know that's fine because that's really it's kind of two committee members taking on or whatever taking on their own initiative here. But um, obviously, if that's the com kind of the committee taking it on um and more people want to get involved it may make sense to spawn a sort of um a, a subcommittee essentially uh that takes on this type of work so i'm gonna bump it over to Kate caitlin so she can kind of talk about where she's at right now and then we can talk as a committee about um you know kind of where the committee wants to take this or you know if they don't maybe it is just a couple of members um with maybe some additional support from other committee members i don't i don't know where that goes so i'm going to take it to caitlin and let her explain her way out of this and i will say i left this as general as i could on the agenda because i don't have a lot of details either <laughs> you just stole my whole intro to this wait oh, sorry the entire <laughs> intro just got <laughs> I feel robbed at the moment. I um, so to clarify, this started a lot smaller in conversation and it became bigger when it got brought back to me. So when we started this, it was how can we celebrate education as a school committee for our entire district? How can we show off what our students do outside of school that relates to things they learn in school or what they're really good at. Where we left it off, Maureen and I, and I actually, um, I was, there's Linda. I actually brought Linda into this by force and <laughs> her family as well. So thank you to the Lakofsky family. Where we are right now, since um, Desi has dropped a large transitional bomb, on us and our teachers are going to be going back and transitioning and our staff and students are going back and transitioning through April and it will take a couple weeks to really kind of secure that. We are hoping to next year make a very large, what is called right now enrichment fair that will encompass science and technology and theater and literature and dance. Our hope is that multiple school committee members will step in and kind of take one piece of that. So student submissions, if it has to be virtual, that you'll only have that one track to really look at and then bring it all together. And if it has to be a virtual platform, virtual platform, but to hold off to see kind of what next year brings. To build community this year and make it manageable and less stress on our students and our staff to get as much participation as we can. We are looking at more of a family night where we offer a few options that work for K to 12 to come in and drop in and do an activity. Or um, one of the ideas was to have a coding. MIT has something through scratch and Mr. Lakofsky has offered to host that. Um, <laughs> he had a little help offering, but he did offer to bring that forward and it works for K through 12. They have a variety of free programming. So to expose our students to that that are interested and to meet other students in the district that are interested, it seems like a really great way to bring it together. In tandem, we were talking about another thing like a craft or some sort of literature piece to kind of bring in on the same night so families could choose. And one that just came today and we have to, we're working on a, two other different ones that are geared toward the upper grades, but I'm gonna hold off speaking on specifics because I kind of would like anyone's input on what they think we could use to bring our K through 12 together. And this year in a small manageable piece and then transition it to that wider version 
and kind of dream that we had for next year. That's where we're at. So something will happen this year and it will happen in late May-ish. And then next year we will take on the reins. And as Narissa said, it is a huge ship to steer. So rather than try to you know, steer it quickly right now, let's ease into it and then really take some time to think about it when everything calms down. Any thoughts on joining Maureen and Linda and I in this? <laughs> So I guess that's the that's the kind of question that I wanted to bring to the committee at this point before they went any farther is um, kind of is there general feedback on making this a committee event and are there people involved to the point where we should spawn this off as a subcommittee or should this continue to be um, the little group? And I will say we're not looking for a giant time commitment. It will not be this all encompassing. You know these meetings will not be long or to put anything more on staff. That was one of my- Yeah, that was one of the big things and which is why we stepped away from that gigantic enrichment fair because I think that would not require staff but it would be helpful if there were staff involved in some way, at least in the planning. So rather than kind of push that, we'll just pull back a little and make it strictly us. And hope if anyone wants to join us, that's great. But if not, it will be something we can handle. So feedback from the committee, I guess my first question is, is anyone else um, interested in joining um, kind of the group that's that's already working there? Paul Mayant. Maybe yeah, I, I love this. I think with all of the ups and downs this year that doing something positive for the community, um, that if, if we can bring it out for them, uh, it's great. And I would do, uh, I'd be happy to, to do what I can to, to bring that and make that happen. Um, don't have ideas right now, 30 seconds in. But <laughs> yeah, this was one of those questions like when do we even bring it back to the committee was one of these, you know, there, there's no great time to have that. So, you know, here's where we are. Anyone else? And I will say, you know, not that it matters one way or another, I guess, but um, once we hit a quorum, that's where we have to officially spawn a subcommittee to handle this. Um, as it stands, it's, it's just a, you know, a, a few members getting together right now. So I'm hearing four right now and I'll, I, I have to say like I, I, I've heard this from a lot of people I think it's great that you're taking this on I have negative extra time right now otherwise <laughs> otherwise I would be happy to help out I mean and and day of or whatever happy to get there I just I can't um because the chair piece of school committee is just sucking my time up right now um anyone else that's interested Okay, and do we have, seeing, seeing no others, do we have any, um, any guidance or opinions for this group? Otherwise, what I'll probably do is put a very informal um, monthly update on the agenda so that they, you guys can just bring it back, um, you know, and, and just provide an update to the committee. All right, seeing none. I will thank you for your initiative. And um, I just have to say too, like I, for my first year on the committee, I didn't talk. Um, <laughs> so uh, <laughs> let's see Brian laughing because I don't shut up now. Things <laughs> <laughs> have changed. <laughs> yes. Um, so can I just say, um, you know, Caitlin taking this on with uh, nine months on at this point, um, kudos to you for, for doing that because that's, it's a huge undertaking at, you know, this point where you still feel like you're um, drinking from a fire hose as far as taking in all the information on committee business, I think. So, all right, thank you. Um, monthly report of the superintendent of schools. Back to Brian. Right, so I'll go quickly through this. Um, there's, I had a learning model update. Obviously, there's no uh, point in reiterating. It's just a quick summary of things we talked about tonight. Uh, as far as fall two sports season at the high school, um, that is underway. Um, I will say there is a, um, a discussion brewing within the Cape Ann League about um, participants, or uh, what's the word I'm looking for, fans, spectators, um, at games, originally the decision was to allow um, the EA, uh, getting the uh, name of the group that has the state guidance 
um, that allows uh, up to 50% of facilities capacity and for indoor and outdoor allowing two fans plus siblings. Um, so originally the, the Cape Ann League athletic directors and principals looked at um, allowing home fans um, to limit um, within the, the, the EEA guidelines, it, it does allow for visiting fans as well. So um, that ramped up in force today in regards to um, aligning with the, the state uh, regulations that allow um, it would be for home and for uh, visiting teams, uh, that it would be two, two individuals per athlete, home and visiting, as well as any siblings. So um, that's a very different thing or a very different concern uh, out in the stadium um, as it would be versus, uh, you know, being in the gym for volleyball. Uh, but it certainly does, it, you know, that creates for a football game. If you've got the band, the football team um, and cheer, um, that's hundreds and hundreds of people. So um, I can just tell you that by way of an update, we're currently sitting at um, allowing two, two spectators per, per home student athlete um, for home games only. Um, but that may change uh, actually the Cape Ann League uh, superintendents are meeting tomorrow morning uh, to have a discussion about that. Um, NIASC update, just to confirm that um, even in pandemic times, uh, NIASC stays true. So uh, NIASC, we did bump, I think we're originally ready for uh, last spring, this past spring, or we're currently in the spring, um, and that was bumped to the fall. So the decennial visit, which is the 10 year visit um, is due in uh, December 12th to uh, Sunday, December 12th to Wednesday, December 15th, uh, will be the visit at Triton Regional High School. Um, Obviously, Patrick Kelly, the principal, and the, the uh, NIASC accreditation committee there at the high school uh, did the entire self-study uh, and got the recommendations for adjustments, and uh, they know exactly what the NIASC committee will be coming back to see. Uh, so just to keep you up to date there, that that is uh, coming due this coming December, now only nine months away. Um, vaccination efforts for staff, I think we've talked about that. Uh, as far as the remote academy, just as far as updates, um, giving you the month over month updates that actually dropped uh, 11 students since last month. Um, I know Kim had just mentioned today there was another student, there's several uh, there that are pending and all of those pendings are actually moving back um, to the hybrid model. Um, and even since uh, I've put this report together, uh, whenever that was on Monday or Friday, um, that the, that number has adjusted and there's, there's a couple more that I've identified as coming back to the hybrid model um, even since knowing that we have uh, uh, a pending shift uh, back to full in-person learning. Um, student learning time regulations, just a quick update that uh, I, I think I told you the first time we had to do a data submission, I submitted it. Um, this time around, I had Kim work on that just to make sure it's two sets of eyes. Um, and so we still pass the test, right, Kim? So we still uh, meet the state's regulations, obviously, these are the regulations that now become um, extinct as of April 5th for the elementary level, uh, April 28th for the middle school and to be determined on the high school. But at the present time for our remote learning, um, we do meet the minimum standards. Um, and just a quick note there about the weekly dashboard, the group has not met. Obviously the data is all trending very much so in the right direction. Um, and we're hopeful of that we'll, it will continue to do so. That might be a record as far as speed. Any questions? But I think it might be as well. Questions from the committee? Sorry, I have one, Brian. Um, there's a position on there that I've never seen before on the hiring um, list. It's a boys and girls, hang on, let me find it real quick. Uh, boys and girls club assistant coordinator. Is that a new position that we haven't had before? That's actually for food services. So that's, that's uh. a whole that Lucinda used to do, used okay. to do, it was a role she had, yeah. um, obviously, um, since she is defecting to the great department. Um, so someone else, Tammy is the uh, cafeteria manager at Salisbury. We're not bitter yet, because she's gonna stay in contact, but yes. <laughs> you sure sound better. Okay, yes, all right, thank you. Any other questions before we move on? All right, seeing none, um, we've already done final budget. Um, subcommittee reports. Linda, do you have anything else on policy? Uh, nope. Okay. Uh, Caitlin on finance. 
I will ask Kyle, but I think we have a, a lot of it was the budget, which we have fully discussed, um, highlighting the grab and go meals that has, that situation has trended in a better direction. And I think that's noteworthy because we've discussed it in the past, but um, Kyle, I'll defer to you, sir. I don't know if I missed anything big. I think you covered it that and then reviewing the, uh, the federal grants that have uh, been coming along and what we anticipate using them for things of that nature, but no, you hit all the bases. Thanks. All right, thank you. Um, Paul, anything else on personnel and negotiations? Sorry, Paul Luis. The only thing I was gonna add, uh, Brian, who else are we gonna meet meeting with? Is it the IAs or the custodians? You're gonna meet with them in, 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 informally? Yep, so custodians, I'm still meeting with. Kyle and I have met with them twice. Um, and so, uh, as you had mentioned for PNN, we're continuing that informally. And then we'll, when we're close, uh, involve the committee. And then um, I just had a request for the IAs, which is unit B of the TRTA um, to meet. And so Kim and I, I met with Paul and Tina or requested of Paul and Tina if they wanted to take the same approach um, and have me have a, an informal meeting with them first. So I believe they requested to meet next week. Um, that's an existing request in my inbox I haven't dealt with yet. So certainly that will be something the both of those, the PNN will have to reconvene on all of those to button up those contracts or MOUs. And that's about it really, um, other than the uh, TRTA has a new negotiator on their behalf. Dina, what's her name? Dina. So Camille Visconti was the MTA rep right. uh, and she retired. So it's Dina Flino, F-L-E-N-O. Right, and, and none of us were invited to Camille's retirement. <laughs> still time uh, <laughs> okay um all right uh correspondence just includes the um rally board of selectmen letter about the budget um obviously committee members have had this for a long time but since this was our first um business meeting since that came in it's actually being included as the correspondence there but um you know we've reviewed it and taken it into account in a couple of different budget meetings so definitely nothing new there all right um I will confirm that 6.30 executive session um, for next, next um, Wednesday to you all by the end of day tomorrow. But I please just hold that, that extra half an hour um, prior to the meeting next Wednesday and, um, and I'll confirm to you as soon as that's um, a definite. That said, can I get a motion to adjourn, please? Make a motion to adjourn. I'll Thank second. Maureen, any discussion? Seeing none, I need a roll call vote, please, Aaron. Yes. Thank you, Paul Goldner. Yes. Thank you, Maureen. Yes. Thank you, Caitlin. Yes. Thank you, Paul Lees. Yes. Thank you, Linda. Yes. Thank you, Paul Mayette. Yes. Thank you, and I'm a yes as well. I appreciate all your time, and uh, I will see you here next week. Thank you all, and have a good night. Thank you, everyone.